11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. And tonight we begin with a weather alert. We're tracking a system spurring strong and severe storms to the west of us right now. This is a new video out of Louisiana where the storm took out entire homes, their businesses, and even heavily damaged a school. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb has been tracking the storms all night for us and their impact once they cross over to Georgia. And Chris, your thing here is people need to be alert. We do need to be aware of this tonight. We are talking about this system weakening somewhat, <coughs> excuse me, as it moves in from Alabama. However, uh, we still think that some of these storms could be strong enough to potentially exhibit some rotation. One example of that right now is up to the north and west of us. I want you to see this right here. You just saw the red polygon that was back here into North Alabama just disappeared. There was a tornado warning in effect with the cell that was moving through there. This is moving closer to Dade and Walker County. Now the National Weather Service has not extended a warning into Dade and Walker County, but they just uh, uh, put out a significant weather advisory and part of that said, though, with an enhanced risk of a tornado as these storms come in here with 40 to 50 mile an hour winds, it is possible that we could see some rotation. Let me show you the velocity with this and you can see some of these areas where the red and green are kind of coming together, uh, coming together here. They've there have been just some spots of some broad rotation. That's what prompted the tornado warnings earlier to the east of the Huntsville area. Now, though, it looks like it's weakening as it gets closer to northwest Georgia. But of course, we'll continue to watch that as it does get closer to see if any rotation does develop out of that. We also have a tornado watch that covers the entire western half of Alabama. I've also been talking with the National Weather Service. They have been collaborating with the Storm Prediction Center. At this point, they don't think that they will extend that tornado watch into eastern Alabama or northwest Georgia. Based on what we're seeing with our air being more stable, we expect these storms to weaken a little bit more. We have more storms though back into Louisiana, actually Louisiana and southern Mississippi with additional tornado warnings. Some of that crossing over the line into southwest central parts of Alabama as well. So this entire system is moving our way. The good news is we expect it to weaken somewhat as it moves in. Now let me show you the latest additional bit of information that we just got in from the Storm Prediction Center. Remember we were telling you that the metro area was just in the dark green color or the marginal risk, which is level one out of five. Well, just within the past 30 minutes, the Storm Prediction Center has now expanded the yellow color, which is the level two of five risk area called the slight risk from Alabama, covering much of West Georgia and into the western metro counties. That means that our chances for stronger storms here on the west side are now increased a little bit. I just want you to be aware during the overnight hours and toward tomorrow morning, there is is that potential for some of these stronger storms that could have some damaging winds and maybe even an isolated brief spin up tornado that we don't think would be a long track storm or widespread. It would be very brief, but again, that could cause some damage. Stay with us. I'm going to keep monitoring that line that's beginning to move into northwest Georgia now and have more on the timing and potential impacts as this system moves in. We'll have more on that in just a few minutes. All right, and if you haven't already downloaded the new 11 Alive News app, make sure you download that and turn on your notification and we'll send you weather alerts straight to your smartphone all night long as we track the system. And now to one of the top stories on 11alive.com. Twin sisters have made it onto the Clayton County Sheriff's Office's top 10 most wanted list. And here are pictures of them. Kyra and Tyra Faison, both 19 years old, and they were accused of kicking down a woman's door last week and then beating her with a frying pan. And this left the victim with serious facial injuries, and they also allegedly stole her phone and car keys. This all happening at the Hampton Downs apartment in Morrow. Anyone with information about this incident is asked to call the investigators in Morrow. 11 Alive's John Sherrick just got his hands on the arrest warrants. They give us a little bit more details about what happened. He'll have that story for us coming up here at 10 o'clock on the ATL. Flames force firefighters to spring into action, rescuing a man trapped inside a home, and that tops our speed feed tonight. It happened at a home off Sheila Court in Lilburn. We sent the 11 Alive Sky Tracker over that home where you can see there are parts of the roof charred and investigators also there at the scene. We we're told the man was found inside that home unconscious on the basement stairs and was taken to the hospital. No word yet on exactly how that fire started. And a man shot while sleeping in his car. Now police are looking for whoever did it. It happened overnight on Auburn Avenue in Northeast Atlanta. Police tell us the victim was hit in the arm and the chest and 
He survived those injuries. Atlanta police are working to figure out exactly why that man was a target. A jury has been sentenced, or selected rather, in the case against the former press secretary of Mayor Kasim Reed. Jenna Garland is charged with obstruction for allegedly telling city workers to delay communications and purposely release confusing information to the media. She rejected a plea deal earlier this year. Opening statements are scheduled for tomorrow morning. The city of Atlanta has already scaled back penalties for marijuana possession, and now the mayor wants to restrict who can access those records. Johanke explains why the mayor signed that order. Well, she did faith her office, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms' office, says there's a connection between expunging marijuana convictions from someone's record and increased wages. Her order calls for records to be restricted for people who possessed an ounce or less of marijuana. It also does the same for previous disorderly conduct convictions under a previously repealed ordinance known as DC-6. The mayor's order calls on the city's chief operating officer, attorney, solicitor, and municipal court judge to get together and establish a process to restrict the records by February 1st of this upcoming year. Under the order, the records won't be erased. Law enforcement will still be able to view them for criminal justice reasons, but the public won't be able to access the records. Mayor Bottoms released this statement reading, The fact remains that communities of color are disproportionately affected by the lingering stigma of victimless minor offenses even long after the accused have paid their debts. This outmoded practice deprives our communities and workforce of brilliant, promising minds, all because of an unfair justice system that can and will be course corrected. Back in 2017, then council members Bottoms and Kwanzaa Hall led the writing of an ordinance that set the fine at $75 for possessing an ounce or less of marijuana, which is on par with the speeding ticket. Several other metro cities and counties have since taken similar actions. Faith. Well, tonight the state will remove 300,000 names from its state voter rolls as a legal battle over the purges play out. It's playing out in federal court right now. The purges have come under fire before. You can remember when Stacey Abrams lost the governor's race to Brian Kemp. At the time, Brian Kemp was still serving as secretary of state. Well, 11 Alive's Doug Richards explains why tonight's purge is being allowed, at least for now. Voters cannot cast ballots until election officials find their names on the state voter list. And the state intends to cut about 300,000 of those names because the state says they no longer live at the addresses in the registry. 11% of all Americans move every year, says the state's chief elections officer. The problem is we don't really know if you still live there, and that's what we want to make sure, that you actually still live in that, you know, residence. The removal of voters comes at a critical time. Federal law requires Georgia to have its voter list in place 90 days before next March's presidential primary. That means Georgia's list has to be set by Christmas Eve. Democrats claim Republicans are trying to shape the electorate to the disadvantage of Democrats, a claim Republicans say is nonsense. Georgia's voter rolls have a lot of inaccuracies. And the Abrams-backed group says it has found voters on the purge list who should not be on it. Folks who didn't get noticed they were about to be removed, then ended up on the list and are very upset, who voted in 2016 should not be removed and are very confused about why they're being removed. Dozens of protesters gathered outside the city of Atlanta's city hall to demand the city address housing concerns, specifically for residents who say they've been forced out of their homes, the People's Town neighborhood specifically. And some of the same People's Town residents who protested today, they talked to us back in 2014 when the city of Atlanta began buying homes in that area. It was a flood-prone area for a new development. Well, the protesters say Fulton County is home to one of the highest eviction rates in the country, and there's a growing need right now for more affordable housing. In the city of Atlanta, they claim longtime residents there can't afford to stay in their homes anymore as new developments continue to lead to higher property taxes and also eminent domain could force others out. We know that the city of Atlanta doesn't understand what displacement really does, the trauma that sets in with that, that never gets addressed. We've seen it. You've demonstrated how that happened, City of Atlanta. You did it with Old Fourth Ward with the Beltline. So we reached out to the mayor's office to ask Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms about the protests and what she has to say about them. Well, we still haven't we still haven't heard back yet. But back in June, though, the mayor unveiled a detailed plan to address affordable housing, and that included building or preserving 200,000 affordable homes by 2026. Is your New Year's resolution to eat healthier? Before you start, we have three diet fads that are surprisingly not so healthy for you. 
And don't forget, we're streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube page. Subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. We've got more 11 Alive news in prime time after the break. We're just two weeks away now from the new year, and a common resolution is to eat healthier, but a study suggesting certain dietary habits actually cut your life shorter, and it says it comes down to three common mistakes. So our medical correspondent, Dr. Sujatha Reddy, is here to help us understand this. This study cites three things people are doing that are extremely detrimental to their health. What are they? Break it down for us. Yeah, they're actually pretty straightforward. This study says that two to three million deaths per year across the world are caused by people eating too much sodium not enough fruit, and not enough whole grains. Those three things are shortening people's lives. And the study also says that one in five deaths are linked to unhealthy eating habits, and the U.S. ranked 43rd on the list of deaths related to poor diet. So what are some easy ways to ensure that when you're eating healthy, you're doing it the right way? Great question. I think one key thing is over the holidays is a hard time to make any transitions. So let's all aim for a fresh start in the new year. It can be simple things like limit sugary beverages, like limit soft drinks, limit juices. You know, meat is a big source of sodium, especially processed meat. So perhaps going meatless Monday, one day a week is a popular trend. That may help you avoid processed meat. Adding a simple serving of fruits to your diet, just a half a cup to a cup is all you need. And then shifting more to the brown or whole grain things. Do whole grain pastas instead of white pastas whole grain bread instead of the white processed carbohydrate loaded bread may actually help you. So simple changes that may actually help you lengthen your life. All right. Well, good diets in the new year is a good thing. Just Always. approach it in a good way. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Reddy. And Georgia Senator David Perdue will be facilitating conversations about college student athlete compensation. He's now joining a bipartisan group in D.C. to tackle this issue. Senator Perdue says the group is working to find solutions and prevent any state, school, or student from being at a disadvantage. Back in October, NCAA leaders voted unanimously to begin changing the rules to allow the athletes to be able to profit from their names, their images, and their likenesses. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. We continue to watch those storms that are moving into northwest Georgia. Just a couple little spotty areas of light rain in here in metro Atlanta. But here's that line of storms coming into northwest Georgia right now. And you see here that we have a, a severe thunderstorm warning that is in effect for parts of Dade and also in Walker County. Now, you're not seeing the crawl running across your screen because legally these two counties are in the Chattanooga viewing area and they're not part of our warning system. But since we're on air with you here. I just wanted to let you know there is a, 
a severe thunderstorm warning in effect for far northwest Georgia in Dade and Walker County. It's going to be in effect until 830. We've been seeing with this system uh, winds of 40 to 50 miles an hour. We also have had a history of some rotation with this back into Alabama. I want to take you in tighter here so you can see this area that we're watching. Now we're not seeing any really tight rotation with this right now. You look for the green and reds there. It has a history of, of having some rotation and we had some tornado warnings earlier back into Alabama. As this moves into Georgia, though, the air is a little more stable. We'll keep an eye on that to see if any of that rotation develops. But as of this point, we don't have that developing out there right now. You can see the storms. That's that leading edge just now coming into northwest Georgia, moving into the Chattanooga area as well. And then look back here into Alabama. All of western, the western half of Alabama is in a tornado watch. We've had numerous tornado warnings out of this system up to the north and then down in south parts of Mississippi and south Alabama, south central Alabama, we have some additional tornado warnings and severe thunderstorm warnings. So this uh, this line of storms does have a history of producing severe weather and also tornadoes. The good news is as it moves into Georgia, our air is just a little more stable. So we expect to see this weekend. We are seeing some evidence of that right now as we had numerous tornado warnings back in the northern Alabama area. Now we no longer have any tornado warnings. We have these severe thunderstorm warnings though right there in the northeast corner of Alabama, northwest Georgia, and right there, <coughs> excuse me, in the southern parts of Tennessee. And so we'll keep watching this line as it moves in and we really hope to see that weakening trend continue. Now, let me throw this at you, though, because as I mentioned, these storms that are weakening, the Storm Prediction Center now has increased the threat level. So I know that sounds kind of uh, uh, contradictory there, because but what we think is that as they weaken, there will still be some strong enough that will have some strong winds with them and maybe could produce some weak rotation or brief spin up tornadoes. And so that slight risk has now been expanded over into the western metro area. It covers West Georgia. That's the level two of five risk. And then earlier, the marginal risk or the green color cut off here at Atlanta. That's now been expanded eastward closer to Athens, covering all of Metro Atlanta. That's the level one out of five risk in those areas. There's that chance for uh, some isolated stronger storms that could develop now. We've been tracking this. This is the STP, the significant tornado parameter where you see those brighter reds and oranges. That's where the tornado risk is higher. That's what we've been seeing in Mississippi moving into Alabama, a lower end risk as it extends up into northern parts of Alabama. So as the storm system moves our way, you see a lot of the reds and oranges on the north side disappear. Still some of that holding together down to the south. And so as this moves into our area, it doesn't totally disappear, meaning the risk for tornadoes, but it's just that low end threat for the overnight hours. This is at four o'clock in the morning on Tuesday and then seven in the morning that moves on over to the east and you see that threat kind of lessening as it moves our way. This is the high resolution rapid refresh and it's even a little bit behind. Those storms are already in northwest Georgia right now, but this shows that main line coming in between uh, in western metro areas closer to two to three in the morning and then through the metro Atlanta area between four and six in the morning. The heavier stuff out to the west and then just some lingering showers left behind before that all ends during the uh, mid morning hours here on Tuesday. It got really warm today up to 70 degrees. We do think though these temperatures in the 60s will stay in the 60s this evening and for much of the overnight hours. So it's not as warm as it was, but still it's going to be mild out there as these storms move in. Thank goodness these storms weren't coming in in the middle of the afternoon when we had those 70s. So here you see between two, four, six, eight in the morning. That's when those rain chances are higher. Those temperatures will be mild. Uh, well, then the warmest air tomorrow is going to be overnight and in the morning. Morning, and then it drops down into the upper 40s later on in the afternoon hours. Here's that timeline. You can see the storms as they're coming in tonight. Here's Metro Atlanta, Western Metro between two and four through Atlanta between four and six in the morning and then continuing to push on over to the east and moving out as then the colder air moves in with that northwest flow that you see right here. So there's what we have with the seven day outlook. Highs tomorrow will be overnight in the morning. Then it gets colder in the afternoon. Wednesday morning, we're down to 32 degrees with a high temperature of 49. Then on Thursday, down to 28 with a high of 53 with dry weather. A few more clouds here on Friday. Showers develop Saturday. Now it looks like they'll linger into Sunday and then drier air on Monday with a high temperature of 62 degrees. It's time for our weekly look at the cuisines and cultures that make up our region. This is At the Table ATL. I'm Matt Pearl. We're now on our 55th episode. 
That means 55 countries whose foods can be found here in Atlanta. And this time, we're headed to one of the premier sushi spots in the city. Let's go to Buckhead and Tomo for a taste of Japan. This is called Aji Tataki, a kind of sashimi. How does Aji Tataki represent Japan? The freshness and quality. Fish needs to be treated in certain way from the time a fisherman catches it till chefs use it. In Japan, they very carefully uh, treat fish. I get fish from Japan Tuesdays and Thursdays. Our uh, three, four days old fish is much fresher than a day old domestic fish. How does it feel to represent Japanese cuisine here in Atlanta? What I found out after I moved here it was uh, when people say sushi, they mean sushi roll. In Japan, is uh, not very popular. It was fun to educate people. That is 55 episodes with even more online. It's an international tour of the foods of our region. You can find them all on Facebook and Instagram at At The Table ATL. I just wish Matt could bring some of those dishes back to the newsroom, right? <laughs> all right, so a nonprofit in Forsyth County is working to make sure that every child in need has a present under the tree this Christmas. The place of Forsyth opens this holiday house. Um, they open this holiday house every year, and it happens in December to alleviate the extra cost that comes with holidays. And parents who qualify for this are invited to go there, and they're able to shop for new and gently used toys using a point system. For many, many people, Christmas is a wonderful, joyful experience, time with family and friends. Um, but for many families in our county, it's a harsh daily reminder of their financial struggles. And so for them to be able to come in with a sense of peace, uh, knowing that there's no judgment involved, knowing that they get to be a part of the process and to potentially find that perfect gift, um, it's hard to really put a price tag on that. Child gets a stuffed animal. Every family gets a board game and they can also get some books. This is the Place Holiday House, our fifth annual um, event, where families who are economically challenged are able to come and shop um, for toys for their kids. We do ask all of our families to contribute a donation of some sort, um, however little or however much they want to give, which also helps it feel less like someone's just giving them something, but they're contributing in the process as well. We believe in that everyone has a purpose and that everyone needs to be treated with dignity and respect. And so all of our services and programs are designed to instill that in the process. I'd just like to say thank you so much uh, to the community for making this happen. And we're hopeful that anyone who wants to can find purpose added to their holiday season at the place. Yeah, you just heard him thank the community there. Well, all the items at the Holiday House come from the community. The place is still accepting donations, so if you can, just reach out to them. The final day for shopping is this Thursday, the 19th. Uh, for more information on the location, the hours, head over to my coming news section on our website, 11alive.com. It's a habit for many of us. You see mold on your food and you toss it because why? It's gross. But our why guy explains why mold may actually be good on some foods.
It's that time of year and a popular gift around Christmas is of course Christmas ham. Depending on the type of ham you receive, you might be tempted to throw it away because of how it looks. But hold on, our white guy explains why mold on some foods like ham is okay. It's not a good look. No one likes it when their leftovers appear wearing a fuzzy green toupee. There's no better reason to toss old food than when it's covered in mold. But hold on, we need to explain why it's okay to keep some foods despite those ugly green spots. Mama, this ham has mold. It's true, some molds can make you sick, but others are actually beneficial to your food. Let's start with cured ham. That's a completely natural characteristic to a country ham. The U.S. Department of Agriculture tells us the curing and drying process allows harmless mold to appear on the ham's surface. You don't want to leave it there. Wash it off with hot water in a stiff vegetable brush. The same goes for hard salami. Just wash away the mold. Sometimes you'll see small mold spots on firm fruits and vegetables like carrots or bell peppers. It's hard for mold to penetrate the hard surface, so just cut the spots away, moving your knife at least an inch around and below the bad spot. If you see mold on soft fruits and vegetables like peaches or tomatoes, toss them. And then, of course, there's cheese. Some cheese is made with mold, and if it's part of the manufacturing process, you're okay. Mold on the surface of hard cheeses can be cut away. Mold on soft cheese that isn't part of the manufacturing process isn't good. Throw that cheese away. So there are plenty of times when mold means a trip to the trash can, but not always. All right, if you have a question for our white guy, send it over to Facebook. We have a Facebook page and also a Twitter page, or you can email it. Coming up, lost tapes are giving an insight into a mass murderer's mind. It's the focus of our new documentary called The Casanova Killer. Details ahead.
We continue to watch those storms that are moving into northwest Georgia. Now that we are at 830, the latest warning for Dayton Walker County that was a severe thunderstorm warning has expired, so they have not issued an additional severe thunderstorm warning to the east of that, but they have issued what they call a significant weather advisory for areas of Catoosa County, also Whitfield County and Murray County. We're going to be watching this system and keeping an eye on this as it comes out of the northern parts of Walker County and moves into a Catoosa and eventually Whitfield. This did have some rotation with it back into North Alabama. Since it's moved into Northeast Georgia, we have not seen any additional rotation with it. Now there's just a little bit right there in the northern parts of Walker County, but that's not enough of a rotation to issue a tornado warning. So we'll keep you posted on that if they have to issue any warnings out of this in Northwest Georgia. You can see those storms as they are just moving in, extending over North Alabama. Plenty of thunder and lightning with this, but um, in North Alabama, even though we had numerous uh, tornado warnings earlier in the northern part of the state around Huntsville and also west of Huntsville, and we're getting some reports of damage in from that too, we don't have any additional warnings as the system gets closer to Birmingham. There is a tornado watch in effect for the western half of Alabama. Also an additional watch back into Mississippi, and that's where we have additional tornado warnings and severe thunderstorm warnings there north of Hattiesburg, south of Jackson. That's moving into the western parts of Alabama as well. So a lot to watch with this system moving in. The good news is our air is a little more stable here. We are seeing some weakening with this, and we expect to see more as we go through the late night hours and overnight too. But Take a look at the risk areas. We mentioned this last half hour. I just want to show this to you again. That slight risk or level two out of five risk has now been expanded to include West Georgia and the western metro areas. The marginal risk, the dark green color or level one out of five has been extended more excuse me, more to the east of Atlanta. So it's in these areas where we could still see some uh, isolated strong thunderstorms with some damaging winds and maybe that low end risk of an isolated brief spin up tornado. We're going to keep an eye on this as it moves our way. The main threats will be overnight. We'll talk more about that with more specifics on the timing in just a few minutes. For the first time ever, newly uncovered tapes reveal serial killer Paul John Knowles explaining the life that led him to become a mass murderer. PJK's cross-country murder spree is the focus of a new documentary called The Casanova Killer. Paul John Knowles made kill tapes. He recorded the details of his murders. The tapes were handed over to the court and locked away in Macon. According to investigators, both fire and a flood damaged countless court records. PJK's kill tapes are presumed to be lost forever. But there's a second set of tapes, and for the first time ever, they provided a telling look into the mind of a serial killer in his own words. What's the worst thing that ever happened to you in your life? I'm going to ask you something else. Uh, what's the best thing? I realized there was a lack of, maybe not a lack of love, but a lack of uh, caring in my way. But I had no doubt that they loved me, but they just didn't get me. Well, if you love somebody, how can you not give them the hospital? Mm -hmm. It's possible. Well, perhaps they did give it, but they just didn't know. Uh, know how to show it. Most of PJK's family passed away a long time ago, but his brother Clifton is willing to provide a look into the childhood of a serial killer. We were so poor, there, there was seven of us living in three rooms. It was like a great room where mom and dad lived in. A little bedroom and a kitchen. We had an outhouse. You know, when you're a child, and certain horrendous things happen to you, you tend to block them out. Well, actually, if I had to live over again, I wouldn't. He wouldn't do it. I wouldn't live again. And those were just only a few brief insights Paul John Knowles shared with a forensic psychologist after his capture back in 1974 right here in Georgia. To hear more about what he had to say and what others have had to say about this case, head over to 11 Lives 
YouTube page. Also watched a full documentary, The Casanova Killer, right there while you were there. So this was a very scary situation over the weekend. Two teenagers now facing charges in a shooting at Cumberland Mall. Now, you may have seen the post on social media claiming this stemmed from an argument over new sneakers. Well, 11 Live's Caitlin Ross has the latest information from investigators. We just heard back from Cobb police who say it was an argument that started at the food court. While that argument caused mass panic on Saturday after the shooting, the mall was back to business today. There were no security guards visible in the food court where just 48 hours earlier, people thought they were running for their lives. The mall was busy but low key, and there was no evidence of the crime scene that was there this weekend. Police say Jouir Ponce and Zaire Dalinal were involved in a fight in the food court that ended in gunfire. Ponce is accused of concealed carry without a permit. Police say he dropped the gun on the ground during the fight, while the other suspect is accused of shooting one man and pointing a gun at another. But today, some shoppers had not even heard of the argument that sent one man to the hospital Saturday and two others to jail. The Cumberland Mall Twitter account alerted shoppers to the altercation on Saturday at 4.14 p.m. and reopened at 4.30 p.m. Hours are normal at the mall through Christmas Eve. The man who was shot at the mall is expected to recover, although police told us this was not about shoes. They've not yet given us a motive as to why the argument turned so violent so quick. All right, so first it was the councilman, and now Hodgson's mayor has to step down amid accusations they made racist comments about a city job applicant. The Hodgson City Council accepted Mayor Teresa Kennerly's resignation after a special meeting on Saturday. Over the summer, Kennerly allegedly dismissed an African-American candidate's application for city manager, saying Hodgson, quote, wasn't ready for a black administrator. Kennerly's resignation comes just days after City Councilman Jim Cleveland resigned for the same situation. He faced backlash for defending the mayor's co comments and allegedly speaking out against interracial marriage. The city is now looking to hold special elections to fill the seats for both Kennerly and Cleveland. How does a dumped drink turn into an arrest? The Georgia Soda Saga? making headlines across the country tonight. And after a disappointing start to the season, the Falcons have knocked off two of the top teams in the NFL. Has head coach Dan Quinn done enough to save his job this season? We have a Falcons insider here to discuss this after the break.
All right, pardon the pun here, but there's trouble fizzing in a small North Georgia community tonight over an alleged soda assault. Now, get this, the wife of a county official accused of deliberately dumping soda over a reporter's head during a budget meeting. According to witnesses there, Abby Winters, the wife of Chattanooga County Commissioner Jason Winters, poured that drink on Cassie Bryant, who is a reporter for All on Georgia. Now, witnesses there told police Winters said Bryant, quote, deserved it, but they didn't see her or hear anything that would have provoked that attack. At her county's or attorney's office, rather, Winters later told investigators she had tripped and accidentally spilled that drink on Bryant, the reporter. Somebody needs to go. I'm sick of it. Oh, that's classy. That's no. Classy. This is every bit of this is that wrong. All right, so here's the thing. All on Georgia's cameras caught that splash and the chaos that happened after, as Commissioner Winters tells the room, every bit of this has been brought on. Well, Abby Winters turned herself in on Friday. She was booked into the Chattanooga County Jail and released the same day. She's now facing several charges, disorderly conduct and simple battery. I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. We are dry now in Atlanta. We're tracking these storms, though, that are moving in from Alabama into northwest Georgia. The ones in northwest Georgia are the strongest ones that we have right now that have moved through Dade and Walker County. They're now moving through Catoosa County and about to move into Whitfield and Murray County. They have 40 to 50 mile an hour winds. I just want to make sure we didn't get a new uh, yeah, no, nothing new coming over for that right now. Uh, winds of 40 to 50 miles an hour. We have seen some signs of weak rotation within this, but not strong enough to issue a tornado warning. So we're watching this very closely as this moves across far northwest Georgia. We have additional storms back into Alabama. We're keeping an eye on these. I'm not seeing really anything when we look at our velocity mode right here that looks really like we'd have any rotation, a little bit of green and red together. That's not enough to issue a warning, though. And what's happening is as these storms come in, they're moving into some more stable air. So we did have numerous tornado warnings earlier around Huntsville and west of Huntsville and then some of those east of Huntsville as well. And we have reports of some damage there, uh, but they're weakening as they come into northwest Georgia. Also, they've taken away part of the tornado watch in far northwest Alabama, but still a tornado watch for much of the west, much of the western half of Alabama right now. And a lot of that is due to these storms coming out of Mississippi. These have tornado warnings with them, severe thunderstorm warnings. We also have a couple of tornado warnings here in the western parts of Alabama. This is south of 350 there near Pennington and Demopolis, and that's moving on up to the north and to the east. So we're just keeping an eye on all of this. And again, our air here is a little more stable, so we expect these storms to be weaker compared to what's been happening over in Mississippi and in western Alabama. But still, there's the potential that a couple of those storms could hold on to some strength to give us some damaging winds and even still the potential overnight of an isolated brief spin up tornado. Here's a look at that watch area or that risk area that we were telling you about uh, that has been expanded. The slight risk or level two, uh, the yellow color that you see there has now been expanded. This did cut off earlier right around the Anniston area. It now has been expanded to cover west Georgia and the western metro area, the marginal risk, the green color or the level one out of five risk has extended now closer to Athens, more of metro Atlanta and over on the east side. These areas have a chance for an isolated stronger storm that can develop. Another look at the STP significant tornado parameter. The highest parameters here are down to the south in Mississippi, moving into the southern parts of Alabama. Watch as the system moves in. Uh, we see a lot of the reds and oranges kind of disappearing, but it doesn't totally go away. We still have some of these low end colors, meaning just that very slim chance, a low end chance for a brief spin up to occur. Uh, and then that all moves out once we get toward the uh, early morning hours tomorrow and moves on over to the east. <coughs> Here again is that marginal risk for Tuesday, where you see as the storms move away, they'll still have a chance for some isolated, stronger storms over to the east of us, but it's all going to be moving out of our area. We had really warm air today. We got up to 70 degrees for high temperature. Thank goodness these storms didn't move in 
when we had those temperatures in the 70s. We're now still mild, but we're in the 60s at 63 degrees and pretty uniform temperatures all over North Georgia in those 60s. We do think we're going to hold in the 60s overnight and in the morning. Look at these temperatures here holding in the 60s. That rain coming in better coverage of rain from 2 to 4 to 6 to 8 in the morning. Uh, the storm risk is going to be higher at 4 and then it's just general showers. We think after that as the system moves out. So the highest temperatures of the day for tomorrow are going to be in the overnight hours and early in the morning. And then these 40s that we have for lows are actually going to be late afternoon and into the evening hours. So the warmest air the first part of the day, the southerly flow here with us overnight. Here's that line of storms as it's moving in by two, three in the morning or one to two. We're going to see these storms in the West Metro counties through Atlanta between two and four. And then over on the east side from four to six and then after six o'clock everything starts moving on away. A couple lingering showers still left behind, but then here's that northwesterly flow that's going to bring in the cooler air. So again, those warmer temperatures will be overnight and early in the morning and then the colder air comes in for the afternoon and we'll even see a little bit of sunshine trying to break through in the afternoon hours too. So only a five on the wasometer Tuesday and then Wednesday morning we're down to 32 with a high of 49 with mostly sunny skies, mostly sunny again on Thursday with a really cold low of 28 and then a high of 53 54 Friday afternoon with a few more clouds showers moving in Saturday and now it looks like that's going to linger into Sunday. We'll be fine tuning that because the models have been going back and forth of that for your Sunday drying out Monday with temperatures back up to 62. All right, so Falcons fans, you know this. It's been an interesting season, right? Well, you're now five and nine. It's a five and nine football team and they've been taken down two. They've already taken down two of the best and if NFC teams this season. So Maria Martin dives into what a surprise win over the 49ers could mean for Dan Quinn's future. After a win in San Francisco on Sunday, here we are with another improbable road win against one of the best teams in the NFC for the Falcons. It was a blood and guts kind of day for, for all, all sides, and it was a hell of a fight. And another day of Julio Jones just being Julio. After review, the runner possessed the ball and broke the plane, therefore it is a touchdown. The fact that he was able to get the ball right outside the goal line and then contort his body to get the ball over the plane, I mean, that's remarkable. It's what great players do. You know, they, they, they find a way to, uh, to get the job done. And uh, again, he's just got an awareness for where he's at and what he has to do to, to get the job done. That was a special play. A win for Atlanta means a thorn in the side of the 49ers playoff picture. And as they scramble up the seating, what does this even really mean for the Falcons? Specifically, what does it mean for Dan Quinn? He's going to have to win back the fan base. I mean, I think we've all seen it. The fans have checked out. I know the players love him. They love playing for him. It's a matter of putting it all together, making the right decisions, going into the season, correcting mistakes as they come up and not waiting too long. Around the bye week, we were all under the notion that Dan Quinn's future was imminent. Now, Arthur Blank has been pretty quiet. For the last few weeks, I don't think anybody's had a real good read on what Arthur Blank is thinking right now. You know, it remains to be seen, but I think getting a win over San Francisco and having that win over New Orleans, that does help when it comes to Dan Quinn's future in Atlanta. Coming up on the AC, UGA's new film program already filling up. Why the director says it's the first of its kind.
All right, it's time for the A scene. It is your one-stop shop for all things entertainment right here in the great state of Georgia. Now, we've got an update on UGA's film program that's a first of its kind. The Dean of Journalism and Mass Communication tells us after announcing their new Masters of Fine Arts in Film program that they've already received inquiries from applicants as far away as China. Now, the new Masters program is between UGA and Georgia Film Academy and even allows students to live in Atlanta's most creative community. Francesca recently caught up with Dean Charles Davis. This is the other side of the coin. If we have below the line workforce, and the Georgia Film Academy is doing an amazing job of creating a, a below the line workforce, this is the above the line workforce coming on now. And this is writers and showrunners and producers and directors. And it's all about, at the end of the day, creating an indigenous filmmaking mm -hmm. ecosystem in the state of Georgia. And the good news, the program is being offered at base state tuition, making this MFA in film a third to a half the cost of most programs. All right, time to catch a casting. Looks like season three of the hit show Dynasty looking for VIP guests for an upcoming scene. Now, casting directors with Central Casting are looking for men and women 18 and up to play VIP guests. Now, ladies size 10 dress size and smaller men waist size no larger than 38. That puts me out of the running right there. It's filming on January 7th and 8th in Norcross, and the pay for the day is $88. Now, for more on the A-Scene, make sure you visit our website, 11alive.com slash the A-Scene, and don't forget to follow us on Instagram and tweet us if you see any celebs around the ATL. Just make sure you use that hashtag, A-Scene. And this holiday season, one little girl is focused on more than just presents. She'll be making history on Broadway's biggest stage. And here she is, 11-year-old Charles Nebris. She'll be performing in the New York City Ballet's production of The Nutcracker. She'll play the coveted role of Marie. It's a role never before 
played by an African-American. So this is big. The news instantly went viral, of course, on social media. But despite her internet fame, Charlotte says she didn't really recognize or realize that she even made history. When she told you that you would be the first black girl playing the part of Marie in The Nutcracker at the Lincoln Center, what was your reaction? I was really surprised. Why? Because I feel like now that we're living in such a progressive time, I was surprised that there hadn't been one before. Well, the New York City production of The Nutcracker runs through January 5th, and we have Natisha Lance with us right now. She's so poised and so pretty and beautiful. Rep I representation is so important. It is, absolutely, especially after Misty, and now you're seeing her do this. I actually just went to go see our Nutcracker here, and it is fabulous. If you guys haven't seen it yet, you should go check it out. And hopefully you get a chance to see her in action as well. Well, I don't know if I'm making it up to New York anytime <laughs> soon, Faith, but I would you love to see you her. Can try. I will be cheering her on from here. We all are. <laughs> all right, hey, it's almost 9 o'clock, and we have a lot coming up next on 11 Live News Primetime. Cars burst into flames on the highway. A reveal investigation investigation looks into the automakers who are not offering a fix for those deadly flaws. Plus, calling for change in Cobb County tonight concerns about conditions inside the Cobb County Jail were taken straight to county leaders. 11 Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Tonight, we are weather aware as we track a system spurring strong and severe storms to the west of us. Just take a look at this damage in Alexandria, Louisiana, where the storms took out entire homes and businesses and even heavily damaged a school there. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb has been tracking the storms all night and their impacts when they cross into Georgia. Hey, Chris. Hey there, Natisha. We are doing also, as we're on live with you on the ATL at 9, we're also doing a Facebook Live. That's why you see my phone right here. I'm talking to you live on camera, on TV. Also, I'm talking live on Facebook to my viewers here, uh, and we are talking talking about these storms as they're moving in. Some comments coming in from Anna Hunt uh, saying hello. We also have um, Vicki Burns saying, I will not sleep until all is well. She's talking about these storms that are moving through. We have other folks saying that some storms were strong as they went through the Alabama area. Let me show you what we're watching right now. If you're watching on the ATL, we're, when I finish this little weather update, I'll continue my discussion on Facebook Live if you guys want to join me there at Chris Holcomb 11 Alive. We don't have any rain in our area right now, but we are watching up in northwest Georgia. These storms that have been moving through, this one is particularly heavy now as it's crossing over 75 through uh, Catoosa County over into Whitfield County. This did have a history of producing some rotation earlier back into Alabama, but we have not had any tornado warnings with that. We're not really seeing any big indicators of any rotation that is strong enough that we would need to issue any warnings with that. We'll keep an eye on that as it moves into northwest Georgia. The main thing we're watching, these storms back in north Alabama, uh, with some, a lot of lightning. We had almost 500 lightning strikes in the 15-minute period with these storms in north Alabama coming into northwest Georgia. The strongest storms are down in south Mississippi, south Alabama, where we have numerous severe thunderstorm warnings, even a tornado warning over here in West Alabama, not too far off from Demopolis. So this entire system is going to be moving our way, but we still think these storms will weaken a little bit as they move in. But let me show you the latest from the Storm Prediction Center. This is the latest update from tonight. You will see here that that uh, yellow color or the level two or slight risk for storms has now been expanded to include West Georgia and into the West Metro area. The dark green color, the marginal risk or level one out of five has been extended over more east of Atlanta. So this is just saying that that severe weather risk is a little more possible over in West Georgia. <coughs> excuse me, with some isolated stronger storms that could have some damaging winds. And there is still even that potential for an isolated brief spin up weak tornado. We're going to keep an eye on that as these storms move in overnight. We'll have more on the impacts and more specifics on the timing coming up in just a few minutes. And as Chris keeps an eye on that, if you haven't already, download the new 11 Alive News app to get weather alerts straight to your phone with all of those updates. Tonight, a plea for change from those who have loved ones inside the Cobb County Jail. Last week, we first told you about reports of unsafe and inhumane conditions behind bars. The sheriff disagrees with those claims. Tonight, the ACLU joined the community to demand answers from the county commissioners. 11 Alive's Latasha Gibbons is live in Cobb County for us tonight. 
Well, Natisha, this is the first time the ACLU was able to address the Cobb County Commission. They were joined by other organizations and relatives of loved ones inside the jail, inmates inside, who talk about what they call deplorable conditions. Now, there are four things that the ACLU is demanding, but before they do that, I want to give you a little bit of background. The ACLU is demanding commissioners pass a directive and create a citizens review board to address the following concerns. First, they want to end the lockdown so loved ones can visit during the holidays. They want to respond to open records requests regarding Medicare and mental health procedures. Third, they want to give details about the circumstances around the alleged recent seven deaths. And fourth, they want to put a plan in in place to prevent future inmate deaths. Now, in a previous emailed response, Sheriff Neil Warren addressed some of those issues. First, with the lockdown, saying it was a method to, quote, discourage bad behavior among inmates. And he also addressed the concerns over health care, explaining they are transitioning to another health care system and that will take some time. Now, commissioners don't have direct authority over the sheriff's office, and that's something the ACLU addressed when we spoke with them. Tonight, I need to bring it to the Cobb County uh, Commissioner's attention. As commissioners, they are over the budget for the Cobb County Detention Center and the sheriff. While the sheriff is a constitutionally elected official, they have to fund the detention center, and with that comes oversight. They need to demand from the sheriff what exactly is going on to uplift this dark cloud that's over Cobb County. When we stepped out of the meeting, commissioners were still hearing public comment, but we're told they are now speaking, responding to those residents who showed up here tonight. We're going to go back in and bring you those details coming up later tonight on Uplate and also online. Natisha, back to you. All right. Thank you, Latasha. We will see you soon. And now to one of the top stories on 11alive.com. Twin sisters have made it onto Clayton County Sheriff Victor Hill's top 10 most wanted list. Kira and Tyra Faison, both 19 years old, are accused of kicking down a woman's door last week and beating her with a frying pan. This left the woman in se with a serious facial injuries. Police say the twins stole a woman's phone and car keys. Now this all happened at the Hampton Downs apartments in Morrow. Anyone with information about where they may be is asked to call investigators. 11 Alive, John Sherrick just got his hands on the arrest warrants. He'll have that story coming up at 10 here on the ATL. Flames force firefighters to spring into action, rescuing a man trapped inside a home. That tops our speed feed tonight. It happened at a home off Sheila Court in Lilburn. We sent the 11 Alive Sky Tracker over that home where you can see parts of the charred roof. We're told the man was found inside the home unconscious on the basement stairs. He was taken to the hospital. No word yet on how that fire started. A man shot while sleeping in his car. Now police are looking for whomever did it. It happened overnight on Auburn Avenue in northeast Atlanta. Police say the man was hit in the arm and chest, but he did survive. Atlanta police are working to figure out why he was targeted. A jury has been selected in the case against the former press secretary for Mayor Kasim Reed. Jenna Garland is charged with obstruction for allegedly telling city workers to delay communications and purposely release confusing information. She rejected a plea deal earlier this year. Opening statements are scheduled for tomorrow morning. And tonight, a public swearing in ceremony and celebration for DeKalb County's new sheriff. Sheriff Melody Maddox is the 50th person to hold the position, but she is the first African American woman. Among her priorities, addressing DeKalb's rising homicide rate, and this year, it set a record with investigators looking into more than 120 homicides, 12 of which are labeled justified. 11 Alive's Hope Ford will have more with the new sheriff coming up tonight at 10 here on the ATL. The city of Atlanta has already scaled back penalties for marijuana possession, and now the mayor wants to restrict who can access old records. Joe Henke explains why the mayor signed this new order. Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms' office says there's a connection between expunging marijuana convictions from someone's record and increased wages. Her order calls for records to be restricted for people who possess an ounce or less of marijuana. It also does the same for previous disorderly conduct convictions under a previously repealed ordinance known as DC-6. The mayor's order calls on the city's chief operating officer, attorney, solicitor, and municipal court judge to get together and establish a process to restrict the records by February 1st of this upcoming year. Under the order, the records won't be erased. Law enforcement will still be able to view them for criminal justice reasons, but the public won't be able to access the records. Mayor Bottoms released this statement reading, The fact remains that communities of color are disproportionately affected by the lingering stigma of victimless minor offenses even long after the accused have paid their debts. 
This outmoded practice deprives our communities and workforce of brilliant, promising minds, all because of an unfair justice system that can and will be course corrected. Tonight, the state will remove 300,000 names from its state voter rolls. A legal battle over the purges will play out in federal court this week, and the purges have come to, under fire before, most notably after Stacey Abrams lost the governor's race to Brian Kemp. That was while Kemp was still serving as Secretary of State. 11 Alive's Doug Richards explains why tonight's purge is being allowed, at least for now. Voters cannot cast ballots until election officials find their names on the state voter list. And the state intends to cut about 300,000 of those names because the state says they no longer live at the addresses in the registry. 11% of all Americans move every year, says the state's chief elections officer. The problem is we don't really know if you still live there, and that's what we want to make sure, that you actually still live in that, you know, residence. The removal of voters comes at a critical time. Federal law requires Georgia to have its voter list in place 90 days before next March's presidential primary. That means Georgia's list has to be set by Christmas Eve. Democrats claim Republicans are trying to shape the electorate to the disadvantage of Democrats, a claim Republicans say is nonsense. Georgia's voter rolls have a lot of inaccuracies. And the Abrams-backed group says it has found voters on the purge list who should not be on it. Folks who didn't get notice they were about to be removed then ended up on the list and are very upset who voted in 2016 should not be removed and are very confused about why they're being removed. Refusing to let a Grinch steal Christmas, how one neighborhood is stopping porch pirates with technology. Chief Meteorologist Chris Holcomb is live on Facebook right now taking all of your weather questions. You can join the conversation on his Facebook page and we will catch up with him after the break. And while you're there, don't forget we're streaming right now on the 11 Alive YouTube channel. You can subscribe and join the conversation in the community section. We've got more 11 Alive news in prime time right after the break. With Christmas just days away, porch pirates are working overtime, stealing packages from your doorsteps. But those pesky pirates may want to think twice before prowling in one community. Now there's a new piece of technology being credited for helping catch a thief. Tis the season for thieving. Bold and heartless porch pirates steal holiday joy and packages with ease. Nationwide, nearly two million packages are stolen or missing every day. But residents of Sandy Springs River Chase neighborhood can place those orders with a little more ease after this arrest. It made, you know, everybody sleep a lot easier that night. Sandy Springs police say a tip from a flock license plate tag reader led to the arrest of this man earlier this week. He was arrested for theft, burglary, loitering, and prowling. It's always great to have uh, the, sec the security cameras here as a deterrent and also something to help um, 
identify crimes either before and or after they happen. The Neighborhood Homeowners Association installed the flock device last year. The solar-powered system snaps pictures of anything coming and going from the area. When one of those license plates comes across our, our neighborhood, then the police department gets a little message, and that's what happened here. Within six minutes, officers were able to make an arrest. Flock covers more than 30 percent of metro Atlanta neighborhoods. That's according to the company. But not every neighborhood is as willing to have the constant surveillance. But Brooke Pointer says these days, getting caught on camera is inevitable. We live in an age where everybody has cameras everywhere. And police suggest using a mail dropbox service with companies like Amazon, UPS, or USPS. And get to know your neighbors. You can help each other out when expecting packages. Hey everybody, I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. Again, I want to explain why my phone is sticking up here. I'm doing a Facebook Live, talking directly to viewers on Facebook Live. Um, people asking like Brittany Han Hanley, when do, when do we expect the storms in Franklin, Georgia? If that, that's in Northeast Georgia, that would be really more toward tomorrow morning. Um, Crystal Oliver says, glad I caught your updates tonight. Thanks for all you do. I appreciate that. Shane Smith is watching in Tallapoosa, Alabama. So I'm doing Facebook Live on my phone the same time that I'm talking to you guys on TV as well. So let me show you what we're watching as we have these storms that are moving into our area here in Northwest Georgia. Here, let me get this into play mode really quick. I was, uh, here we go, all right. In Northwest Georgia, we're watching those move through. Uh, we do not have any warnings on these storms, but we do have what is called a significant weather advisory with these storms that are over the Ringgold area and north of Dalton as they're moving into Murray County right now. Heavy rain, thunder and lightning with those winds of about 40 to 50 miles an hour, and that's just below the criteria for a severe thunderstorm warning. These storms did exhibit some rotation earlier back into North Alabama where we had some tornado warnings, but we don't see any rotation with that right now. In fact, I can look here at the velocity. I don't see anything really that's standing out as far as any rotation there in North Georgia right now, but we're keeping an eye on that as it moves through. The main storms back into Alabama, a lot of rain with that on the northern part of the state, but down into uh, central, western central Alabama, we have a tornado warning, additional tornado warnings back into parts of Mississippi as well, and that's where we have uh, severe thunderstorm warnings too. That is all moving over toward the east and eventually will make it into Georgia. The good news is we think that this is going to weaken as it gets closer to us. And when I say weaken, I mean compared to what it was doing in Mississippi, Louisiana, and in Alabama. They still may hold together enough to give us some strong thunderstorms with damaging winds. And there is even still that chance for an isolated brief spin up tornado in the overnight hour. So let me walk you through what we're watching. This is a new development tonight from the Storm Prediction Center. Um, they have extended or expanded that slight risk area. The yellow color that you see right there has been extended to include the Metro Atlanta area. I'll zoom in a little bit tighter so you guys can see there what we're watching with that yellow color now including West Georgia, the West Metro counties. And so a slight risk is the level two of five risk, meaning there's a chance as these storms move in, we could have a few, <coughs> excuse me, scattered thunderstorms that could be severe. Then there's the marginal risk just to the east of Atlanta, extending closer to Athens. That's the level one risk for only a couple of isolated storms there. So we, we're looking at the significant tornado parameter, which shows the oranges and reds down here in south southern parts of Mississippi moving into Alabama. I want you to notice how those colors kind of go away as the system moves closer to us. They don't totally disappear, but it goes down the scale to a low end risk once these storms move into our area overnight. That's why we're still saying there's a low end risk for some of those isolated brief spin ups that could occur. And then all that severe weather threat by seven o'clock in the morning is well off to the east and we won't have any worries about any tornadoes or anything after that. Still a marginal risk east of the city and south of the city through the day tomorrow, but those storms will be moving out and our main thing is gonna be watching for the colder air to move in once the rain moves out. So here's a look at that line of showers and storms moving in tonight. Here we are at three in the morning. You can see that stretching through North Georgia, down into West Georgia, three in the morning, approaching the Western Metro County counties coming through Atlanta between three and five and six in the morning. And then the strongest of the storms will already be east of the city by seven in the morning. So it's that area, that time frame between two and six in the morning through Metro Atlanta, where we'll see that potential for 
those strongest storms to come in, damaging winds, and yes, that potential for an isolated brief spin up tornado. And then throughout the morning hours, the back edge of the rain moves out. We'll see drier air moving in and colder air literally blowing into our area. 61 degrees is our temperature now. <coughs> Excuse me now. We got up to 70 this afternoon. So very warm air, mild air in place right now. We're going to hold in the 60s for the rest of the evening hours and overnight when these storms come in. And then the colder air comes in during the uh, afternoon hours tomorrow. So the warmest air of the day is actually going to be overnight and in the morning, and then it gets colder late in the afternoon. Then we dip down to 32 degrees in the uh, morning hours on Wednesday, down to freezing, and then 28 on Thursday morning. Thank goodness it's going to be dry when it's that cold. A few more clouds build in on Friday. Then Saturday, the rain chance comes back at 40%. Now it looks like those showers will linger into Sunday and will dry out on Monday, with temperatures actually warming up behind that system, getting back up to 62 for the first part of your Christmas week. So this Christmas, are you dreaming of a Dalmatian or maybe praying for a Pomeranian? Well, if so, don't be so quick to buy or to adopt. Tonight we are sharing some pro tips when it comes to picking out the perfect pet. Hey, my name is Randy Beck and I'm a practicing veterinarian and owner of South Cherokee Veterinary Hospital. Here are a few pro tips for you picking out the best pet for you and your family. Tip number one, pick out the best pet for your location. People that live in apartments tend to go for smaller dogs, but don't overlook the fact that some larger dogs work well in an apartment as well. But if you can pick a dog that has more of a calm nature, such as a Greyhound, even a Great Dane, they can make great pets. If you live in a larger home, dogs that are more excitable might be a better fit for you, such as a German Shepherd, Dalmatians, Weimaraners. Tip number two, owning animals for people who have a lot of allergies. I would definitely recommend going with something with a poodle. Poodles just don't tend to shed very much. All dogs shed a little bit. It's a misconception that they don't shed at all. However, if they don't shed a lot, they do have hair that tends to grow, which means you're going to have to have their hair cut. So it does come with a consequence. Other than poodles, other great options for people with allergies would be maybe a Lhasa Apsa, uh, Bichon, a Maltese, some wire-haired terriers as well. Tip number three. Pets and children. Without a doubt, I would say golden retrievers and Labrador retrievers tend to be some of the most popular. Also, I think poodles are, are a great fit as well. If you noticed out there, you see that everything's got poodle in the mix. It's golden doodles, it's labradoodles, it's bernie doodles, it's sheepoos, it's cockapoos. And they've been a great poodle crossbreed uh, for a variety of reasons. Some with the hypoallergenic aspect that we talked about earlier, and also just because they're very easy going with kids. You can check out more pro tips by going to youtube.com slash 11 alive. I'm Naima Abdullahi. This week we sit down with a well-known motivational speaker who helps to transform lives all over the world. But his journey started right here in Atlanta where he learned to tap into his potential and also overcome challenges. In life, the playing field is not always even. I have big dreams, goals, and aspirations to do something great, uh, not only for my family, but for my community. Inky Johnson grew up in East Atlanta, attended Crim High School, and lived in a two-bedroom home with 14 people. His mother worked double shifts to put food on the table. I, I take pride in, in this city. It makes me who I am, right, growing up in Kirkwood. The Crim High School grad aspired to become an NFL star, and as a University of Tennessee recruit, he was destined to make his dream come true. I was projected to be a draft pick, projected to make millions of dollars in the NFL. But on September 9, 2006, a routine play on the field didn't go according to plan. A simple tackle sacked his dream away. Inky suffered a career-ending injury to his right arm, forcing him to reevaluate his goals in life. And so when my arm got paralyzed in the process, it wasn't an option of stopping. It wasn't an option of going back home. I went to disability <laughs> services, I learned how to write with my left hand, and I graduated. Inky Johnson started telling his story to anyone who was willing to listen. I really want you to search on what do you really want out of this thing called life.
I'm a firm believer that uh, people are driven by contribution. Fast forward 13 years later, he now captivates different crowds, traveling across the country as one of the most requested motivational speakers. If I could touch or impact one life, you know, if I could play a part in one person's journey, it's all worth it for me. Inky Johnson is now dedicated to helping others tap into their potential, same way he found his greater purpose. First and foremost, never lie on a situation or circumstance to define your life. Tesla is taking another step into the future with a new patent, and we're connecting the dots with its new windshield wiper technology. Windshield wipers replaced with laser beams. That's the concept of a new patent Tesla filed. Larry Seward from our sister station in Houston connects the dots for us on this one. Tesla is known for pushing the envelope when it comes to car technology, and its latest invention is a whole new take on the lowly windshield wiper. Let's connect the dots. Elon Musk's innovative car company has filed a patent to use lasers to clean windshields, burning off dirt and debris instead of wiping it off. In the patent application, Tesla calls out traditional wipers, calling them inefficient, leaving a wet windshield that is not entirely clean. The pulsed laser cleaning system will apparently not damage the eyes of anyone inside the vehicle. The system monitors the windshield for any dirt, and when it finds it, the laser zaps it right off. So while we may not have flying cars yet, it looks like we might get ones that shoot laser beams. Up next. Hey, man, you might want to get back. It might blow up. It was, it was surreal. Get over! Vehicles bursting into flames on the roadways. Get away! The car maker is accused of not offering a fix. My life was put at risk. My family's life was put at risk. A reveal investigation coming up on Prime Time on WATL.
I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. No rain here in Atlanta right now, but we are tracking some storms in northwest Georgia. Some of these still have some 40 to 50 mile an hour winds with them. These are in far north Georgia, right around the Dalton area. For Whitfield and Murray County, the National Weather Service has issued a significant weather advisory. We have winds there 40 to 50 miles an hour, not quite to severe thunderstorm criteria, but it's just below that. So just know there could be some strong winds and very heavy rain with this. Also some lightning. I want to look at the lightning count just here in northwest Georgia. It'll include the stuff back into Dade and Walker County, moving over to the uh, Whitfield and Murray County area. We have about 41 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes, but let me widen out a little bit and you can see the additional lightning and storms that are extending back throughout much of Alabama and even into Mississippi. I'm going to put this into live mode right now and I'm going to do a lightning count on this as well. And you can see here, including uh, this activity back into Mississippi and Alabama and into northwest Georgia and parts of Tennessee. We have more than 500 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes. That all is going to be moving into uh, West Georgia and Metro Atlanta in just a little while. Let me get rid of that right there and you can kind of see what we're watching here with these storms as they continue to move into our area tonight with that heavy rain. There is a risk for some strong storms. Let me show you the latest from the Storm Prediction Center. In the middle of the evening hours tonight, the SPC expanded that yellow color or the slight risk, which is level two out of five into West Georgia and into the West Metro counties. And then the green color or the level one or marginal risk for storms extends to the east of Atlanta, out closer to Athens. As these storms move in, yes, we think they will be weaker than what we see in Alabama, Louisiana, and Mississippi, but some of them could still be strong enough to give us some strong winds and even an isolated brief spin up tornado that wouldn't last long, but something that we have to watch for those overnight hours. Stay with us. We'll put a timeline on this. This is going to be while you're sleeping, so I'm going to let you know what to expect overnight and toward tomorrow morning. Welcome to the reveal on primetime. I'm investigator Faith Abube. Drivers who own Kia and Hyundai vehicles just won a $750 million settlement against the car makers. It comes after hundreds of the company's vehicles burst into flames on the road without much of an explanation. But the goodwill gesture comes with a catch. These are the last memories school teacher Jessica Miner has of her Kia Optima. The first car she and her husband bought as a family. We had, you know, a lot of memories in that car. She was expecting to make many more when August 29th, on her way to pick up her two children, the family car burst into a ball of fire. It was, it was, it was surreal. Moments earlier, you were sitting right there. Right there. And had no clue what was coming to the door. I don't know what I would have done if... I got stuck. They may might want to get back. It might blow up. By the time firefighters choked out the flames in the Snellville parking lot, Miner was already trying to figure out what went wrong. I was very confused because I know I hadn't hit anything, you know, I hadn't ran over anything. The engine wasn't even due for its first oil change. In fact, Miner had just gotten it back from a Kia dealership with a brand new engine. That was barely three months prior when Kia and Hyundai recalled more than 1.6 million vehicles because of engine failure due to debris. They give us an engine that's supposed to be new and it catches on fire. I mean, I just, that's just bizarre to me and it's scary. It's very scary. If they think just that recall alone, which is for engine debris, that uh, is going to fix this problem? Well, the evidence would suggest that it's not. For Jason Levine, the executive director of the Center for Auto Safety, Miner's story is part of a troubling trend now emerging from the engine fire concerns. Get over! What is going on? We've got hundreds of fires spread across five different uh, models for them. This is frightening. Levine's group was already demanding a massive recall of 2.9 million Kia and Hyundai vehicles. After hundreds of complaints, these models were randomly catching fire without so much as a crash. I wouldn't get near it. Get over! Get over! Get away! Get away from it! And now this discovery that even newly replaced engines are still catching fire. It's raising concerns that perhaps the car maker might not even know what's causing the problem. 
car fires kill people, they injure people, uh, and they certainly put everyone on the road in danger. So we'd like to see Kia and Hyundai take this a little more seriously than just putting out press releases. Kia hasn't issued a recall to specifically address these engine fires, nor has it said exactly what's causing them. But in a statement to the 11 Alive investigators, the company says all cars have the ability to catch fire. And if Kia is aware of a post-recall repair incident, it'll work with the customer to reach a satisfactory resolution. It certainly sounds like good PR spin, but I think if you talk to Kia customers who have had these vehicles burn up on them, that's not the experience they're having. Mm -hmm. Don't Minor hadn't heard from them for weeks until the 11 Alive investigators started contacting Kia. These are not the kind of souvenirs you wanted to keep. No, not, right, not at all. You know, my life was put at risk. My family's life was put at risk. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry, it's just not going to cut it. Who knows how many other ticking time bombs are out there on the road. Kia and Hyundai have now agreed to start reaching out to the owners of those vehicles that have caught fire, but not all the owners affected by the multiple recalls. And right now, it's not clear how much money those expecting the settlement will actually receive. You can see even more in-depth investigations like this one by going to our website, 11alive.com. The Reveal, the only local investigative show in the country, airs Sunday at 6 p.m. on our sister station, 11 Alive. Tonight, flags across the state are flying at half-staff in honor of a Georgia sailor. He was killed in an attack on a Florida Naval Air Station. 21-year-old Airman Apprentice Cameron Walters was shot and killed alongside two fellow sailors while on watch in Pensacola. A procession was held Friday as Walters' body was escorted from Savannah to his hometown, Richmond Hill. His funeral was this afternoon. Governor Brian Kemp said it was fitting to honor Walters' sacrifice today. The Navy says Walters and his fellow airmen Mohammed Hathman and Joshua Watson saved the lives of many others. The Navy has posthumously awarded wings of gold to all three airmen in recognition of their heroism. The FBI is investigating the Pensacola attack as a presumed act of terrorism. <laughs> Two teenagers now facing charges in a shooting at Cumberland Mall. You may have seen posts online claiming this stemmed from an argument over new sneakers. 11 Alive's Caitlin Ross has the latest information from investigators. We just heard back from Cobb police who say it was an argument that started at the food court. While that argument caused mass panic on Saturday after the shooting, the mall was back to business today. There were no security guards visible in the food court where just 48 hours earlier, people thought they were running for their lives. The mall was busy but low key and there was no evidence of the crime scene that was there this weekend. Police say Jawir Ponce and Zaire Dalinal were involved in a fight in the food court that ended in gunfire. Ponce is accused of concealed carry without a permit. Police say he dropped the gun on the ground during the fight while the other suspect is accused of shooting one man and pointing a gun at another. But today, some shoppers had not even heard of the argument that sent one man to the hospital Saturday and two others to jail. The Cumberland Mall Twitter account alerted shoppers to the altercation on Saturday at 4.14 p.m. and reopened at 4.30 p.m. Hours are normal at the mall through Christmas Eve. The man who was shot at the mall is expected to recover, although police told us this was not about shoes. They've not yet given us a motive as to why the argument turned so violent so quick. Amid talk of various health care cutbacks at Georgia facilities, one Metro Atlanta hospital is actually growing. That begins our speed feed. Our partners at the Atlanta Business Chronicle report Northside Hospital Forsyth is planning a $44 million expansion. The project includes a two-story addition to an existing patient tower, making room for more surgical short stay and observation beds. There are also multi-million dollar proposals at other Northside facilities, including a $96 million expansion in Cherokee County. Two hunters were cited for illegally killing a black bear in Blakely County. According to Georgia Department of Natural Resources, the hunters said they mistook the bear for a large hog. Someone reported the dead bear to game wardens just last week. The two hunters were cited for hunting at night and killing a bear out of season. Blakely County does not have a bear hunting season, but in surrounding counties, it starts December 21st. 
Boeing has just announced it will stop production of its troubled Max 737 jet starting in January. The company says it just temporarily is halting this, but it's struggling to get approval from regulators to put the planes back up in the air. Boeing says there will not be immediate layoffs at its plant near Seattle, but the ripple effect could cause jobs that cost jobs at some of the 900 companies that supply parts for jets. The Max has been grounded since March after two deadly crashes overseas. Coming up, lost tapes are giving insight to a mass murderer. It's the focus of our new documentary, The Casanova Killer. For the first time ever, newly uncovered tapes reveal serial killer Paul John Knowles explaining the life that led him to become a mass murderer. Knowles' cross-country murder spree is the focus of a new documentary, The Casanova Killer. Paul John Knowles made kill tapes. He recorded the details of his murders. The tapes were handed over to the court and locked away in Macon. According to investigators, both fire and a flood damaged countless court records. PJK's kill tapes are presumed to be lost forever. But there's a second set of tapes, and for the first time ever, they provided a telling look into the mind of a serial killer in his own words. What's the worst thing that ever happened to you in your life? The worst? I was going to trip. Well, let me ask you something else. What's the best thing that ever happened to you in your life? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing good. Huh? I realized there was a lack of. 
maybe not a lack of love, but a lack of uh, caring in one way or the other. But I had no doubt that they loved me, but they just ignored me. Well, if you love somebody, how can you not give them the hospital? Hmm? It's possible. Well, perhaps they did give it, but they just didn't uh, know how to show it. Most of PJK's family passed away a long time ago, but his brother Clifton is willing to provide a look into the childhood of a serial killer. We were so poor, there, there was seven of us living in three rooms. It was like a great room where mom and dad slept in, a little bedroom and a kitchen. We had an outhouse. You know, when you're a child, and certain horrendous things happen to you, you tend to block them out. Well, actually, if I had to live over again, I wouldn't. You wouldn't do one. I wouldn't do it again. Those were only a brief insight into John Paul Knowles, or Paul John Knowles, what he shared with a forensic psychologist after his capture in Georgia in 1974. To hear more about what he had to say and what others have to say about that case, you can head over to 11 Alive's YouTube and watch our full documentary of the Casanova Killer. We're still watching and tracking those storms up in North Georgia. They've been moving across the northwest corner of the state from Dade County, Walker County, over into Catoosa County, Whitfield County, Murray County. Still some thunder and lightning there. The leading edge and the heaviest of these storms right now are in the western parts of Fannin County, also moving into western Gilmer County. Very heavy rain, 40 to 50 mile an hour winds with this part right up here. Uh, this did have a history with some rotation when it was in Alabama. It does not have any rotation now as it's over parts of far north Georgia, but it does have some heavy rain with it and those 40 to 50 mile an hour winds, a lot of lightning with it too. As we extend back into north, through northwest Georgia, these storms extend down to the northern parts of Gordon County, also into Chattooga County near the Somerville area, and they continue to move over to the east, but then additional storms are out to the west. Those are gonna keep moving our way too. Right now, the main threats in north Alabama are are storms with a lot of lightning. We've had about 500 lightning strikes in the past 15 minutes with this in North Alabama, Northwest Georgia, and into Tennessee. And then to the south of that, south of Birmingham, this is where we have a tornado warning that is in effect right now. This moved through the Demopolis area just a little bit earlier and is now north and east of Demopolis, getting closer to Alabaster. This is south of Tuscaloosa. That will keep moving to the north and east and then additional storms back into Mississippi with severe thunderstorm warnings and tornado warnings were in effect with that too. So very active weather here in the south. The good news is as this moves into Atlanta or into Georgia, we expect that the air is a little more stable. We expect these storms to weaken a little. Now when I say that, I mean compared to what was in Mississippi and Louisiana and Alabama, but they might still have some of these storms strong enough to give us some strong winds and even that low end risk of an isolated brief spin up. Take a look at what we're watching. Let's look at this on the bigger picture and you can see that yellow color there. That is the level two of five risk, the slight risk. The Storm Prediction Center tonight did expand that into uh, the western metro counties and western Georgia. Earlier, it cut off right around Anniston with the marginal risk over into Atlanta. Now that marginal risk or level one out of five risk extends a little bit more over to the east. So uh, that means that there's still a chance for some of these storms as they move in uh, to develop some damaging winds, maybe a brief isolated spin up tornado. We don't think it will be widespread or a long track tornado or anything like that. Now it's been warm today. We're still mild in the 60s. We had up to 70 for a high today. We think these temperatures are going to hold in the 60s for much of the rest of the evening hours and overnight as the rain and the storms move through the area. And then once the rain ends in the morning, then these temperatures are going to drop. So the high temperature that you see for tomorrow is actually going to be in the 60s here overnight and early in the morning. And then the 40s you see here will actually be late afternoon into early evening with that colder air that's going to be moving in. We're only going with a five on the wisometer, our scale from one to 11, where an 11 is a perfect day. Here's what we're watching those storms crossing through northwest Georgia and, and through north Georgia during the nighttime hours tonight. By 2 o'clock, they're covering more of west Georgia, approaching Atlanta, really between 2 and 4, when these are going to be impacting the west side and over Atlanta. And then 3 to 5 
over to the east side through Atlanta and to the east of us by 6. We think it's going to be nearing Athens and over near Lake Oconee. And then once that pushes over to the east, it'll be ending. A couple of lingering showers left behind, but the storm threat will be over, we think, by well before 9 o'clock in the morning. And then that northwest flow will be here. So remember, the highest temperatures of the day tomorrow are going to be in the overnight hours and early morning. And then those temperatures fall during the day will actually be in the upper 40s late in the afternoon hours with a little bit of sunshine that's going to try to break through. And then look at this. There's the freezing line that extends down to the south and to the east of us on Wednesday morning. I do think we'll hit freezing here in Atlanta. Much of North Georgia and West Georgia will be there at the freezing mark before things start to, uh, you know, stay chilly on Wednesday afternoon. But we will see a lot of sunshine around for your Wednesday as well. How about rainfall? We're going to see many areas in the blue color um, between now and seven in the morning, indicating one and a half, a half to one and a half inches of rain. Um, some areas might pick up just a little bit more. I'm just saying on average between one and two inches of rain as the system moves on through. So just be prepared for the showers and that potential for some strong winds. And again, maybe that brief spin up isolated uh, tornado. But I don't think there'll be many of those around. We've got those showers in the morning. They move out, then it gets cold. We're down to 32 Wednesday morning with a high of 49, mostly sunny skies. Down to 28 Thursday morning with a high of 53. Thank goodness it's going to be dry when it's that cold. A few more clouds on Friday with highs near 54. Showers move in on Saturday, 40% chance, not raining all day. And then some of these showers linger into Sunday, may stick around a little longer now, and then drying out Monday with partly cloudy skies. After 50s for the weekend, we go back to the lower 60s for the first part of next week. The students at the Gwinnett County High School were in for quite a surprise when they got to class this morning. Grammy Award winning singer Sierra made an appearance at a freshman computer class, computer science class that is, at Paul Duke STEM High School in Norcross. The students have been using code to remix two of the singer songwriter's songs. School leaders say this was a great opportunity for students to gain real life feedback on their work. <laughs> Um, just adding Sierra into it, it's a great way to incorporate more types of students, getting more girls involved um, with computer science. I always tell people the importance of believing in yourself. So having girls be able to actually remix the song makes it more meaningful to them. I like that. It was unexpected. It, it's a nice surprise to have Sierra, the person we've been working on to remix our songs, come. Pull out a line or two. It's a real world out, uh, like experience that most kids don't get to have. School officials also said that students will be able to win a trip to Seattle and Amazon gift cards as part of the competition. For more on this story, visit mylawrencevillenews.com.
the Atlanta Hawks are in the giving spirit. The team partnered with State Farm to unveil a new State Farm Good Neighborhood Club. This is part of the team's season of giving holiday activities. The club features a renovated dance studio at the Bessie Burnham Park in East Atlanta. The Hawks say they hope this can be a safe space for kids to express their creativity. Things are looking peachy for one college football team, at least according to uh, Zoo Atlanta. Yang Yang, a 22-year-old male giant panda, gives number four Oklahoma the win over number one LSU in the upcoming Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl. Workers set out two boxes painted with the team's logos, and Yang Yang made it very clear he thinks Oklahoma will take home that trophy. The teams will meet at Mercedes-Benz Stadium on December 28th, and the winner advances to the College Football National Championship game on January 13th in New Orleans. Here's a look at that rain and thunderstorm activity in northwest Georgia, getting closer to Rome, moving through Fannin, Gilmer County. More of these showers will push into our area later on tonight. We are watching for that potential for some strong winds, maybe an isolated brief spin up tornado, but that's a low end risk. It clears out and gets cooler tomorrow and chilly for the middle of the week. All right, we have more news and weather coming up right here on the ATL. Eleven Alive News Primetime on the ATL starts now. Two teenagers charged in a shooting at Cumberland Mall. Tonight, police are saying the social post claiming this started with a fight over sneakers. Plus, another legal challenge to stop the state from purging voter registrations. We're breaking down what happens next in this battle. 
But first, we're expecting big changes in the forecast as we track the chance for storms overnight. And our chief meteorologist is Chris Holcomb. He is in the Storm Tracker Center. A busy night, Chris. What are we expecting hour by hour? Well, we're watching these storms that are in northwest Georgia right now. At this point, we do not have any warnings. We had severe thunderstorm warnings earlier in Dade and in Walker County. Uh, those storms have moved over now into parts of western Gilmer County and western Fannin County. We have some very heavy rain, 40 to 50 mile an hour winds with these storms and lightning. But they're just below what we can would we consider a severe thunderstorm warning. We also had some rotation with this when it was back into North Alabama, but that has weakened. No tornado warnings with this coming through. These storms are moving over toward the east. They'll continue pushing into that direction. More of that will move in later on tonight with these storms back into Alabama. This is where we have a tornado watch in effect for much of the western half of Alabama and then some tornado warnings. This one here uh, just north of Demopolis and south of Birmingham that prompted a tornado warning and then a additional warnings that are back along the Mississippi and Alabama line. All of this is going to continue moving into our direction. The good news is our air is a little more stable, so we hope to see some weakening, but not total weakening. If you let me show you what we're watching, the Storm Prediction Center has now expanded that slight risk or level two of five risk for severe storms into West Georgia and the West Metro counties. And then the marginal risk or level one of five has extended through Atlanta east of the city. This means that tonight as these storms move closer to us, there is a chance that some of those could be strong with damaging winds and it's not out of the question. There could be a low end threat for an isolated brief spin up tornado for those overnight hours. The timing on this, these storms are going to be moving through overnight. Here we are past midnight around two to three in West Georgia going through Metro Atlanta early in the morning with that storm risk. Stay with us. We'll have more on that timing and some potential impacts for you. We'll have more on that in just a few minutes. And be sure to download the 11 Alive app to get weather alerts wherever you are. You can also use it to stay ahead of the weather with our interactive radar and our updated forecast. Twin sisters, 19 years of age, on the run tonight, accused of a violent attack on a 20-year-old woman last week. She survived, but Clayton County Sheriff put the twins on his top 10 most wanted list, warning that the twins could be armed and they could be very dangerous. Here is John Shirick. The arrest warrants describe the twin sisters as brutally beating a young woman they know. The twins, 19 years old, Kyra Faison on the left and Tyra Faison. The sheriff says Kyra and Tyra showed up at this apartment in Morrow at 2 in the morning this past Tuesday, the 10th. According to the warrants, they were after 20-year-old Leah Elsko. They're accused of kicking open the apartment door, going inside, grabbing a frying pan and beating Elsko in the face with it, then pulling her outside, beating her with their fists and taking her car keys and smartphone. Elsko had to be treated at a hospital for head injuries. Sheriff Victor Hill distributed a photo of the Faison twins that he said is on social media, warning people who might spot them that they may be armed. Sheriff Hill placed them together on his top 10 most wanted list, asking for tips to help capture them. Kyra was already wanted on separate charges, including reckless conduct and a firearms charge. The charges this time against both twins include felony aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and aggravated battery. <laughs> Two teenagers now facing charges in a shooting at the Cumberland Mall. You may have seen the posts online claiming this stemmed from an argument over shoes, but tonight police are telling Caitlin Ross there is no truth whatsoever to those claims. Yeah, they say it's not true. That was a rumor that was running rampant on social media, but we just heard back from Cobb police who say it was an argument that started at the food court. Well, that argument caused mass panic on Saturday after the shooting. The mall was back to business today. There were no security guards visible in the food court where just 48 hours earlier, people thought they were running for their lives. The mall was busy but low key, and there was no evidence of the crime scene that was there this weekend. Police say Jouir Ponce and Zaire Dalinal were involved in a fight in the food court that ended in gunfire. Ponce is accused of concealed carry without a permit. Police say he dropped the gun on the ground during the fight, while the other suspect is accused of shooting one man and pointing a gun at another. But today, some shoppers had not even heard of the argument that sent one man to the hospital Saturday and two others to jail. The Cumberland Mall Twitter account alerted shoppers to the altercation on Saturday at 4.14 p.m. and reopened at 4.30 p.m. Hours are normal at the mall through Christmas Eve. The man who was shot at the mall is expected to recover. 
Although police told us this was not about shoes, they've not yet given us a motive as to why the argument turned so violent so quick. Flames force firefighters to spring into action, rescuing a man trapped inside a home. This happened at a home of Sheila Court in Lilburn. We sent the 11 Alive Sky Tracker over the home, where you can see parts of the roof were charred there. We're told the man was found inside the home unconscious on the basement stairs and was taken to the hospital. No word on how that fire started. A man shot while sleeping in his car. Now police are looking for whomever did this. It happened overnight on Auburn Avenue in Northeast Atlanta, and police say the victim was hit in the arm and the chest, but he did survive. Atlanta police are working to figure out why that man was targeted. Georgia will purge some 300,000 names from the state voter rolls beginning tonight, but a judge could order them reinstated later in the week. 11 Alive Dog Richards walks us through the case working its way now through federal court this week. Voters cannot cast ballots until election officials find their names on the state voter list. And the state intends to cut about 300,000 of those names because the state says they no longer live at the addresses in the registry. 11% of all Americans move every year, says the state's chief elections officer. The problem is we don't really know if you still live there, and that's what we want to make sure that you actually still live in that, you know, residence. The removal of voters comes at a critical time. Federal law requires Georgia to have its voter list in place 90 days before next March's presidential primary. That means Georgia's list has to be set by Christmas Eve. Democrats claim Republicans are trying to shape the electorate to the disadvantage of Democrats, a claim Republicans say is nonsense. Georgia's voter rolls have a lot of inaccuracies. And the Abrams-backed group says it has found voters on the purge list who should not be on it. Folks who didn't get notice they were about to be removed then ended up on the list and are very upset. Who voted in 2016 should not be removed and are very confused about why they're being removed. New from the nation's capital, Georgia Senator David Perdue will be facilitating conversations about college student athlete compensation, meaning he is going to be talking uh, a, a lot about what's going on as far as athletes go. He's joining a, a bipartisan group in Washington, D.C., tackling the issue. Senator Perdue says the group is working to find solutions and prevent any state, school, or student from being at a disadvantage. In October, the NCAA leaders voted unanimously to begin changing rules to allow athletes to profit from their names, images, and likenesses. Senator Perdue at one time was the CEO of Reebok and wrestled the shoe contract away from Nike in the National Football League. Ebola is often a deadly virus many of us may have forgotten about since four Americans were diagnosed back in 2014, but other countries are just starting to recover from epidemics that killed thousands in West Africa. An Atlanta woman got an up-close look when she went there to help. She talked with our Hope Ford. Kirill Guthrie is back in America after spending nine months in Sierra Leone. It's not a vacation. Guthrie, a construction manager for Doctors Without Borders, helped build one of the largest hospitals in the country. We literally raised the forest and started building a completely new hospital from scratch. Sierra Leone has one of the world's highest maternal and childhood mortality rates. After 2014's Ebola outbreak that lasted for several years, Sierra Leone struggled to keep health care workers. Almost 4,000 people were killed in the epidemic. Ebola is, is horrible. It's devastating and to an entire country. The 63-bed hospital is being built in several phases. When I say build a building, we're building it from scratch, digging the foundations and building up to the roof. And this was Guthrie's seventh assignment for Doctors Without Borders. She says each one provides a different eye-opening experience. It didn't occur to me how privileged we were here in the U.S. But she says in Sierra Leone, she saw firsthand what perseverance can look like. Not only is the country recovering from the Ebola epidemic, but also from a decade-long civil war. Sometimes you see how well that they're progressing after some of the things that they've been through, and you think, wow, I don't even know if I could have done that. Guthrie will take a few months off before signing a new contract with Doctors Without Borders, possibly heading to a new country. It's a lot of hard work, um, but you get to see the fruits of your labor like immediately. 
You know, you hear Doctors Without Borders and you might think you need a medical background in order to participate, but the organization is always looking for mechanics or engineers and people with logistical skills who have worked internationally before. To learn more about it, you can visit our website, 11alive.com. A nonprofit in Forsyth County is working to make sure that every child in need has a present under the tree this Christmas. The Place of Forsyth organization is working to alleviate the extra costs that come with the holidays. Using a point system, parents are invited to shop for new and slightly used toys, clothes, bedding, and bicycles. Staff members say what makes this event different is their focus is in uh, instilling dignity and respect in the process. At The Place, um, we believe in that everyone has a purpose and that everyone needs to be treated with dignity and respect. And so all of our services and programs are designed to instill that in the process. That's how our food pantry works, that's client choice, and that's how we want our holiday house to work, where parents are able to choose the toys that their kids want. All of the items at the holiday house are donated by people in the community. The place of Forsyth is still accepting donations and families who have a need. The final day of shopping will be on Thursday. Is your New Year's resolution to eat healthier? That's an honest and an honorable idea for sure. <laughs> Can we do it? Up next, three diet fads that are surprisingly not so healthy for you. We're just two weeks away now from the new year, and a common resolution is to eat healthier, but a study suggesting certain dietary habits actually cut your life shorter, and it says it comes down to three common mistakes. So our medical correspondent, Dr. Sujatha Reddy, is here to help us understand this. This study cites three things people are doing that are extremely detrimental to their health. What are they? Break it down for us. Yeah, they're actually pretty straightforward. This study says that two to three million deaths per year across the world are caused by people eating too much sodium, not enough fruit and not enough whole grains. Those three things are shortening people's lives. And uh, the study also says that one in five deaths are linked to unhealthy eating habits and the U.S. ranked 43rd on the list of deaths related to poor diet. So what are some easy ways to ensure that when you're eating healthy, you're doing it the right way? Great question. I think one key thing is over the holidays is a hard time to make any transitions. So let's all aim for a fresh start in the new year. It can be simple things like limit sugary beverages, like limit soft drinks, limit juices. You know, meat is a big source of sodium, especially processed meat. So perhaps going meatless Monday, one day a week is a popular trend that may help you avoid processed meat. Adding a simple serving of fruits to your diet just a half a cup to a cup is all you need and then shifting more to the brown or whole grain things do whole grain pastas instead of white pastas whole grain bread instead of the white processed carbohydrate loaded bread may actually help you so simple changes that may actually help you lengthen your life all right well good diets in the new year is a good thing just Always. approach it in a good way <laughs> all right thank you so much dr reddy
We are in the process of tracking a system spurring storms and even a tornado to the west of us. Our chief meteorologist Chris Holcomb now is keeping an eye on all of it and what it means for us here in the metro area. Yeah, we've got this line of storms in northwest Georgia right now. It's going to be a while before we see these storms move into metro Atlanta. It's going to be mainly during the overnight hours when you're trying to sleep. And you can see what we're dealing with right now to the north and west. This is the initial area of rain that is moving through. The strongest right now is over here in the northern parts of Fannin County. You can see near Mineral Bluff, south of McKaysville, where we have some heavy rain thunder and lightning. These storms have traveled all the way through from Alabama across northwest Georgia. They had a history of producing some rotation earlier back in Alabama, but we haven't seen any of that rotation here in North Georgia. The main thing that we've been watching has been some pockets of heavy rain and a lot of thunder and lightning, and more of that is coming in out of Alabama. In fact, let me widen out a little bit. Let me break down first that severe weather threat that is down in Alabama. A tornado warning south of Birmingham right now for these areas getting closer to Alabaster near Centerville, Alabama, just north of Marion, where we have, <coughs> excuse me, some rotation there that has prompted a warning. More tornado of a tornado watch out to the west and severe thunderstorms coming out of Louisiana into uh, out of Mississippi and into Alabama. All of these storms are going to be moving closer to us. Let me put this into live mode really quick here. I want to do a lightning count on these storms coming out of Alabama, including what we have going on in Tennessee and in northwest Georgia. And this is pretty impressive. We've seen some pretty high lightning counts out of this. We're talking about almost a thousand lightning strikes in this line of storms, and much of that is over north Georgia. Let's do a count just on north Georgia right now. I want to get it a little bit tighter here, and we can do a lightning count just here in northwest Georgia, and we see some pretty high uh, lightning counts with that too, over a hundred in the past 15 minutes. So we're going to be watching all of that as it moves toward us tonight with rain, lightning, and even a damaging wind threat. And it's not out of the question for an isolated brief spin up tornado. Take a live look out there right now. I want to show you our live camera. This is coming in from Rome and the roads are dry. No rain in Rome right now. Of course, the sky is dark, but we've been looking out toward the west to see if we see any of that lightning there as we're looking toward the west. A lot of times we can see some of those strikes in a dark sky, even all the way over into Alabama. We're not seeing that flashing right now, but I do think that lightning is just going to intensify as it gets closer to Rome. So we'll be uh, checking on that uh, on that tower cam throughout the night. As I mentioned earlier, the slight risk level two of five risk has extended into West Georgia. The marginal risk level one of five is just east of Atlanta. Very mild air. We're going to stay in these 60s the rest of the evening and overnight. Then it'll get colder tomorrow afternoon. You can see those 60s staying with us as those storms come in between two and four is that risk for the strongest storms and then just some lingering showers for a while. 64 in the morning and then 40s in the afternoon as our temperatures are going to be kind of backwards tomorrow. We're going to go with a five on the wasometer. Here's the timeline watching these storms. They're approaching our area between two and four here in Metro Atlanta four to six over on the east side as those stronger storms will move on out and then any lingering showers will die out. There's that northwesterly flow bringing in the colder air. So our high tomorrow will take place overnight. The lows will be late afternoon into the evening. Then we're down to 32 Wednesday morning with a high of 49, 28 Thursday morning with a high of 53 with dry weather. Partly cloudy Friday, a few showers develop on Saturday. Now it looks like they'll linger into Sunday, then drying out Monday. Partly cloudy skies, a little warmer though, back up to 62. The movie about the 1996 Olympic Park bombing in Atlanta has not done very well at the box office. Clint Eastwood's film brought in just $5 million over the weekend, putting it in fourth place. One of the lowest opening grossing weekends ever for Eastwood. The HAC claims the movie smeared one of its former reporters. The movie suggests that she traded sex for secrets. Coming up on the AC, UGA's new film program already filling up. Why the director says it's the first of its kind.
All right, it's time for the A scene. It is your one stop shop for all things entertainment right here in the great state of Georgia. Now, we've got an update on UGA's film program that's a first of its kind. The Dean of Journalism and Mass Communication tells us after announcing their new Masters of Fine Arts and Film program that they've already received inquiries from applicants as far away as China. Now, the new Masters program is between UGA and Georgia Film Academy and even allows students to live in Atlanta's most creative community. Francesca recently caught up with Dean Charles Davis. This is the other side of the coin. If we have below the line workforce, and the Georgia Film Academy has done an amazing job of creating a, a below the line workforce, this is the above the line workforce coming on now. And this is writers and showrunners and producers and directors. And it's all about, at the end of the day, creating an indigenous filmmaking mm -hmm. ecosystem in the state of Georgia. And the good news, the program is being offered at base state tuition, making this MFA in film a third to a half the cost of most programs. All right, time to catch a casting. Looks like season three of the hit show Dynasty looking for VIP guests for an upcoming scene. Now, casting directors with Central Casting are looking for men and women 18 and up to play VIP guests. Now, ladies size 10 dress size and smaller men waist size no larger than 38. That puts me out of the running right there. It's filming on January 7th and 8th in Norcross, and the pay for the day is $88. Now, for more on the A scene, make sure you visit our website, 11alive.com slash the A scene, and don't forget to follow us on Instagram and tweet us if you see any celebs around the ATL. Just make sure you use that hashtag, A scene. Students at the Gwinnett County High School were in for a big surprise when they got to class this morning. <laughs> That is Grammy Award winning singer Sierra, who showed up at Paul Duke STEM High School in Norcross. Freshman students in the computer science class have been using code to remix two of her songs. It's part of a competition in partnership with Amazon and Georgia Tech. During the visit, Sierra took the time to speak to every student and provide feedback on their remixes. What a power couple that is, married to Russell Wilson, the great quarterback, I the know. MVP candidate. She got fine lucky. Fine player. Yeah, she didn't get lucky. I think those are. <laughs> meant to be. Those are two great talents. Yeah. Finding each be. other. It was fate. It's the way it's supposed to be, right? <laughs> yes. Well, that does it for me. I'll Where see you, you at 11. Excellent. I'm going to get ready for up late on oh. 11 Alive. <laughs> so we, we will see you in a spell, as we yeah, like to say. Yeah. So if you're business. up late, then you should join us for more. All right. Very good. I'll try to keep my earpiece in here, and we'll continue <laughs> for the next 30 <laughs> minutes in your absence. Thank you. Do Natisha. the best you can, Jeff. I'll do my best. <laughs> All right. Here's what's coming up. Congress poised for a momentous week in American history with President Trump facing an impeachment vote in the House of Representatives. Next, why some Democrats say impeachment is in your certainty.
Congress is making its way toward history now with the full House expected to vote to impeach President Trump as early as midweek. But that will not be the last word. The Senate already squaring off for a likely trial next month where Republicans will take the reins. Here is NBC's Alice Barr with the very latest from Washington. In town halls and main streets across America, representatives about to vote on whether to impeach President Trump are getting one last chance to hear from the people who sent them to Washington. Swing state, moderate Democrats like Michigan Congresswoman Alyssa Slotkin facing a delicate balance. I will be voting yes. She was cheered and booed at a town hall today in announcing she would support impeachment. I feel that in my bones, and I will stick to that regardless of what it does to me politically, because this is bigger than politics. Congressman Jeff Van Drew of New Jersey taking a different stance, signaling he'll switch to the Republican Party over his opposition to impeachment, a move that could save his seat in a traditionally conservative district. Oh, yes, he absolutely will get my vote for turning into a Republican. Yes, he will. Democrats have a clear majority in the House, making impeachment a near certainty, with a vote as early as Wednesday. Overnight, the House Judiciary Committee issued its full 658-page report, outlining two articles of impeachment and finding that President Trump has, quote, realized the framers' worst nightmare. We have a, a president that wants to throw the Constitution in a paper shredder. And with a January Senate trial the likely next step, Democrats are criticizing Republicans for coordinating with the White House, despite taking an oath to do impartial justice. Top Democrat in the Senate, Senator Chuck Schumer, is calling for days of new witness testimony in the Senate trial. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell says the two leaders will talk details very soon. Tonight, a plea for change from those who have loved ones inside the Cobb County Jail. Last week, we first told you about reports of unsafe and inhumane conditions in jail. The sheriff disagreeing with those claims. And tonight, the ACLU joined the community to demand answers from the county commissioners. Love and Eliza Latasha Givens has the story from Cobb County tonight. Well, this was the first time the ACLU addressed the Cobb County Commission. They were joined by other organizations and relatives of inmates inside the jail to talk about what they call deplorable conditions. Now, here's a little background. The ACLU want commissioners to pass a directive and create a citizens review board to address the following concerns. First, they want to end the lockdown so loved ones can visit during the holidays. Second, they want the sheriff's office to respond to open records requests regarding Medicare and mental health procedures. Third, they want the sheriff to give details on the circumstances surrounding the alleged recent seven deaths. And fourth, they want a plan in place to prevent future inmate deaths. Now, in a previous email response, Sheriff Neil Warren addressed the lockdown issue, saying it was, quote, a method to discourage bad behavior among inmates. And he also addressed the concerns over health care, explaining they are transitioning to another health care system. Now, commissioners don't have direct authority over the sheriff's office, and that's something the ACLU also addressed. Tonight, I need to bring it to the Cobb County uh, commissioners' attention. As commissioners, they are over the budget for the Cobb County Detention Center and the sheriff. While the sheriff is a constitutionally elected official, they have to fund the detention center, and with that comes oversight. They need to demand from the sheriff what exactly is going on to uplift this dark cloud that's over Cobb County. One commissioner stated the medical examiner should be contacted about those recent seven deaths, and he also made it clear that the sheriff, as an elected official, should be allowed to run the jail. SEC Spit will let you know what other commissioners have to say. Back to you. In DeKalb County tonight, a public welcome for the new sheriff. Melody Maddox was sworn in two weeks ago, but this was the first opportunity for those who live in DeKalb to visit with her. According to the county, she is the 50th sheriff in county history the first woman to hold the job. Public trust requires accountability and good stewardship. She has a very tough job ahead of her. Sheriff Maddox started working in the sheriff's office in 1996. She replaces Sheriff Jeff Mann, who retired last month. She worked at a county jail. Now she's on the other side of the law, accused of having an inappropriate relationship with an inmate. 26-year-old Dorothy Pike, a contract nurse at the Troop County Jail, now facing charges. The sheriff's office says she admitted to having a relationship with an inmate. We're told she worked at the jail for six months before the allegations first surfaced. 
A video of a reporter getting touched inappropriately, going viral. Now Savannah police have made an arrest. Here he is, Thomas Calloway, and he is charged with sexual battery. He's caught on camera touching the reporter while she was doing a live broadcast covering a, a running race. The reporter says she was hurt emotionally and physically. The video has been viewed over 10 million times. Dozens of protesters gathered outside of Atlanta City Hall to demand the city address housing concerns, specifically for residents who say they have been forced out of People's Town. Some of the same People's Town residents who protested talked with us in 2014, five years ago, when the city began buying homes in the flood prone area for a new development. The protesters say that Fulton County is home to one of the highest eviction rates in the country, and there is a growing need for more affordable housing in the city of Atlanta. They claim longtime residents, they can't afford to stay in their homes. New developments continue leading to higher property taxes and eminent domain could force others out. We know that the city of Atlanta doesn't understand what displacement really does. The trauma that sets in with that, that never gets addressed. We've seen it. You've demonstrated how that happened, city of Atlanta. You did it with Old Fourth Ward with the Beltline. We reached out to the mayor's office to ask Mayor Bottoms uh, about the protest, but we have not heard back in June. The mayor unveiled a detailed plan to address affordable housing, including building or preserving 20,000 affordable homes by the year 2026 in Atlanta. First, a councilman now uh, Pushton's mayor has stepped down amid accusations they made racist comments about a city job applicant. The Houston City Council accepted Mayor Teresa Kennerly's resignation after a special called meeting on Saturday. Over the summer, Kennerly allegedly dismissed an African-American candidate's application for city manager, saying that Houston, quote, wasn't ready, end quote, for a black administrator. Kenner Kennerly's resignation comes days after City Councilman Jim Cleveland resigned. He faced backlash for demanding, uh, defending the mayor's comments and allegedly speaking out against interracial marriage. The city is now looking to hold special elections to fill the seats for both Kennerly and Cleveland. Today, flags across the state flying at half staff in honor of a Georgia sailor killed in the attack on a Florida Naval Air Station. 21 year old airman apprentice Cameron Walters was shot and killed alongside two fellow sailors while on watch in Pensacola, Florida. A procession was held Friday as his body was escorted from Savannah to his hometown of Richmond Hill. The funeral this afternoon, Governor Kemp said it was a fitting honor. For his, wall, for his sacrifice, ordering flags be flown at half-staff. The Navy says Walters and his fellow airmen, Mohammed Hatham and Joshua Watson, saved the lives of many others. The Navy has posthumously awarded wings of gold to all three airmen in recognition of their heroism. The FBI is investigating the Pensacola attack as a presumed act of terrorism. More changes to holiday shipping you need to know. This time it's Amazon taking a shot at FedEx. NBC's Joe Ling Kent explains how it could impact your holiday packages and the price that you pay. Tonight, Amazon is making a sudden change to your holiday shipping during the busiest time of the year. The company is no longer allowing third-party sellers to ship Amazon Prime orders with FedEx ground this season, citing a drop in delivery performance. Third-party sellers make up 58% of Amazon's offerings. This change could impact their customers now. It's likely that package will not arrive in maybe that one or two day prime time frame. Toy seller Molson Hart is furious. It causes us to pay more per shipment and it actually forces us to raise prices for consumers. The swift change comes as Amazon ramps up its own delivery system. Right, CEO Jeff Bezos broke ground on a new one and a half billion dollar air hub in Kentucky. The company already delivers about half of its own packages in the U.S. FedEx tells NBC News Amazon's decision limits the option for those small businesses on some of the highest demand shipping days in history and may compromise their ability to meet customer demands and manage their businesses. The shipping wars leveling up with just nine days to Christmas. This holiday season, one little girl focused on more than presents. She will be making history on Broadway's biggest stage. 11-year-old Charlotte Nebris will perform in the New York City Ballet production of The Nutcracker. She will play the role of Marie, a role never played by an African-American before. And the news instantly went viral. But despite her Internet fame, Charlotte says she didn't realize she was making history. When she told you that you would be the first black girl playing the part of Marie in The Nutcracker at the Lincoln Center, what was your reaction? 
I was really surprised. Why? Because I feel like now that we're living in such a progressive time, I was surprised that there hadn't been one before. The New York City production of The Nutcracker runs through January 5th. It's a habit for many of us. You see mold on your food and you go, man, get that away from me. But our Y guy explains why mold is actually pretty good for some of your food. And we're watching these storms that are moving through the area right now into West Georgia and North Georgia, approaching Atlanta overnight while you're trying to sleep. I'm going to break down the timing and what you can expect as these storms roll through. Terrific victory for the Falcons yesterday, but also a loss during the game. We'll explain after the break. popular gift this time of year, of course, the Christmas ham. And depending on the type of ham you receive, you might be tempted to say, you know, this doesn't look right. There's mold on this thing. But our Y guy explains why mold on some foods, including a ham, that's a good thing. It's not a good look. No one likes it when their leftovers appear wearing a fuzzy green toupee. There's no better reason to toss old food than when it's covered in mold. 
But hold on, we need to explain why it's okay to keep some foods despite those ugly green spots. Mama, this ham has mold. It's true, some molds can make you sick, but others are actually beneficial to your food. Let's start with cured ham. That's a completely natural characteristic to a country ham. The U.S. Department of Agriculture tells us the curing and drying process allows harmless mold to appear on the ham's surface. You don't want to leave it there. Wash it off with hot water in a stiff vegetable brush. The same goes for hard salami. Just wash away the mold. Sometimes you'll see small mold spots on firm fruits and vegetables like carrots or bell peppers. It's hard for mold to penetrate the hard surface, so just cut the spots away, moving your knife at least an inch around and below the bad spot. If you see mold on soft fruits and vegetables like peaches or tomatoes, toss them. And then, of course, there's cheese. Some cheese is made with mold, and if it's part of the manufacturing process, you're okay. Mold on the surface of hard cheeses can be cut away. Mold on soft cheese that isn't part of the manufacturing process isn't good. Throw that cheese away. So there are plenty of times when mold means a trip to the trash can, but not always. All right, if you have any questions for the Y guy, all you have to do is send it to him, and you can do it over Facebook, Twitter, or through the email. And uh, we have uh, a story now on deadly storms. They are ripping through several parts of the country today. A dangerous night expected in, the, in uh, this part of the world where numerous tornado watches and warnings have been in effect. At least one person died after an apparent tornado hit central Louisiana. The violent storm destroyed a school. It toppled trees and power lines as well. And that same system brought heavy snow from the Midwest to the Northeast, leaving at least nine dead on the roads. Here's NBC's Miguel Almaguer. Tonight in Louisiana and Mississippi, a tornado emergency. Near Alexandria in central Louisiana, a near disaster. A school turned debris field, incredibly no injuries. With roofs ripped off gas stations, reports of twisters slicing through communities. The path of this tornado stretching some 63 miles. At least one storm fatality reported, with mangled trees covering homes, roads, and buildings. With so many at risk in the south, westbound has four plows. 11 million remain in the grip of dangerous snowstorms in the Midwest to the Northeast. At least nine have died in weather-related crashes. Parts of Missouri still digging out after whiteout conditions. Uh, I was not expecting this weather. It was crazy. I woke up and uh, snow everywhere. With snow and reported tornadoes delivering a deadly blow, tonight the forecast calls for more misery ahead. <clears throat> I'm meteorologist Chris Holcomb from the 11 Alive Storm Trackers. We have a new development here for you. We have a new tornado watch that stops right at the Georgia and Alabama line. It is extended now uh, to include much of eastern Alabama, and it includes Cleburne and Randolph County. Now, even though you see this box extend up into Polk County and into um, uh, areas of uh, Harrelson County, you're not in that watch. That's just kind of like a little overlap. So this stops right at the Georgia line and it includes Cleburne County and Randolph County, Alabama. A new tornado watch that'll be in effect uh, and for the overnight hours until early tomorrow morning around six in the morning. So that's because of these storms that are moving through south of Birmingham are about to move out of the first tornado watch. It's going to extend up into this tornado watch again that includes Cleburne and also Randolph County. At this point, West Georgia is not included in a watch. We'll keep an eye on these storms though as they move in. If they hold together, um, we'll see if they will extend that watch over into West Georgia. But as of right now, uh, no watch included here in in, uh, parts of western Georgia. These storms have prompted a tornado warning there. This is south of Birmingham, right there, that red polygon that you see south of Alabaster, right here near Centerville. And that area of rotation is going to continue moving up toward the north and the west. We still think these storms will weaken a little more as they move into Georgia during the overnight hours uh, because we have a little more stable air in place. We're still going to have some rain, thunder, and lightning. The potential for damaging winds may be a brief isolated spin up tornado, but we don't think that would be very widespread. Here's another live look out there right now. We're keeping an eye on our cameras. This is in Rome. I've kind of moved it over more toward the north and west, and we're looking.
looking toward the distance there to see if we see any of that lightning in the distant sky. We don't see any of that right now. We do think we'll see more of that lightning developing uh, as these storms get closer to the Rome area. There's that slight risk that has been extended over into Atlanta. That's the level two of five risk. Marginal risk level one of five over to the east of us. Mild air in place. I want you to watch these temperatures. We're going to see our high temperatures for tomorrow happening during the overnight hours and the morning hours. In the morning, it's going to be 63 degrees. Watch what happens after those storms move out. Temperatures will fall at noon tomorrow. We'll be at 50 degrees and then we'll hold in those lower 50s and then be in the 40s by the uh, end of the afternoon hours. We're also going to have a lot of wind around. If you have Christmas decorations, any inflatables out there, make sure they are anchored or they might be blown into your neighbor's yard as we're going to see these wind gusts around 26 in the morning and then wind gusts tomorrow between 10 and 20 miles an hour and then maybe more wind gusts coming in here moving into a Tuesday night and also into Wednesday. So we have those storms moving through overnight tonight. Then it's windy and cold tomorrow. Uh, temperatures dropping into the upper 40s by the end of the day uh, or into the afternoon. Freezing Wednesday and Thursday morning but dry and then rain moves in Saturday lingers into Sunday drying out again Monday. It's time for our weekly look at the cuisines and cultures that make up our region. This is At The Table ATL. I'm Matt Pearl. We're now on our 55th episode. That means 55 countries whose foods can be found here in Atlanta. And this time, we're headed to one of the premier sushi spots in the city. Let's go to Buckhead and Tomo for a taste of Japan. This is called Aji Tataki. A kind of sashimi. How does Aji Tataki represent Japan? The freshness and quality. Fish needs to be treated in certain way from the time a fisherman catches it till chefs use it. In Japan, they very carefully uh, treat fish. They get fish from Japan Tuesdays and Thursdays. Our uh, three, four days old fish is much fresher than a day old domestic fish. How does it feel to represent Japanese cuisine here in Atlanta? What I found out after I moved here, it was uh, when people say sushi, they mean sushi roll. In Japan, is uh, not very popular. It was fun to educate people. That is 55 episodes with even more online. It's an international tour of the foods of our region. You can find them all on Facebook and Instagram at At The Table ATL. Sports on this Monday night. Falcon season has been a, uh, oh, I don't know. I guess you could define it a lot of different ways. Let's just give it by the numbers. They're now five and nine. They have been up and down and over and round and trying to figure out where they're going next is something that, you know, even the most knowledgeable football fan really doesn't have the answer. Here's Maria Martin as she dives into what a surprise win over the 49ers could mean for Dan Quinn. After a win in San Francisco on Sunday, here we are with another improbable road win against one of the best teams in the NFC for the Falcons. It was a blood and guts kind of day for, for all, all sides, and it, it was a hell of a fight. And another day of Julio Jones just being Julio. After review, the runner possessed the ball and broke the plane, therefore it is a touchdown. The fact that he was able to get the ball right outside the goal line and then contort his body to get the ball over the plane. I mean, that's remarkable. It's what great players do. You know, they, they, they find a way to, uh, to get the job done. And uh, again, he's just got an awareness for where he's at and what he has to do to, to get the job done. That was a special play. A win for Atlanta means a thorn in the side of the 49ers playoff picture. And as they scramble up the seating, what does this even really mean for the Falcons? Specifically, what does it mean for Dan Quinn? He's going to have to win back the fan base. I mean, I think we've all seen it. The fans have checked out. I know the players love him. They love playing for him. It's a matter of putting it all together, making the right decisions, going into the season, correcting mistakes as they come up and not waiting too long. Around the bye week, we were all under the notion that Dan Quinn's future was imminent. Now, Arthur Blank has been pretty quiet. For the last few weeks, I don't think anybody's had a real good read on what Arthur Blank is thinking right now. You know, it remains to be seen, but I think getting a win over San Francisco and having that win over New Orleans, that does help when it comes to Dan Quinn's future in Atlanta. Man, that'll be interesting to see what happens. I don't have a feel for that either. I, I know I hear it from a lot of fans, but you know, it's like juggling cats right now. I don't know how it goes. Dan Quinn announced today that defensive end Tack McKinley will miss the final two games of the regular season with a shoulder injury. So Tack's final numbers for the 2019 season, 29 tackles 
and three and a half sacks. Not a very good season for him. The NFL has announced that Josh Gordon has been suspended indefinitely for violating the league's policies on performance enhancing substances and substance abuse. So that's why the Patriots got rid of him. Also, this is Gordon's sixth suspension since 2013. You know, it, it is a shame. It, it is an incredible shame. Let's hope that things work out for him in his life. There are other issues certainly to deal with than football. Big night for Drew Brees. Tonight, Brees becomes the NFL's all-time leader in career passing touchdowns, breaking Peyton Manning's record. Brees' 540th career TD pass was his third of the game, and the Saints are currently beating the Colts 34-0 in the fourth quarter. It is, man, they are, they are really giving it to him tonight. We'll take a break. We return right after this. Here's more on that new tornado watch that includes East Alabama, and it does include Randolph and Cleburne counties. It does not include any counties in Georgia. We'll keep you posted on whether or not that watch could get extended over to Georgia. We'll have more on that on up late at 11 on 11 Alive.